forward and cast of characters for hearts of three by jack london this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. hearts of three by jack london forward i hope the reader will forgive me for beginning this forward with a brag in truth this yarn is a celebration by its completion i celebrate my fortieth birthday my fiftieth book my sixteenth year in the writing game and a new departure hearts of three is a new departure i have certainly never done anything like it before i am pretty certain never to do anything like it again and i haven't the least bit of reticence in proclaiming my pride in having done it and now for the reader who likes action i advise him to skip the rest of this brag and forward and plunge into the narrative and tell me if it doesn't just read along for the more curious let me explain a bit further with the rise of moving pictures into the overwhelmingly most popular form of amusement in the entire world the stock of plots and stories in the world's fiction fund began rapidly to be exhausted in a year a single producing company with a score of directors is capable of filming the entire literary output of the entire lives of shakespeare balzac dickens scott zola tolstoy and of dozens of less voluminous writers and since there are hundreds of moving pictures producing companies it can be readily grasped how quickly they found themselves face to face with a shortage of the raw material of which moving pictures are fashioned the film rights in all novels short stories and plays that were still covered by copyright were bought or contracted for while all similar raw material on which copyright had expired was being screened as swiftly as sailors on a placer beach would pick up nuggets thousands of scenario writers literally tens of thousands for no man nor woman nor child was too mean not to write scenarios tens of thousands of scenario writers pirated through all literature copyright or otherwise and snatched the magazines hot from the press to steal any new scene or plot or story hit upon by their writing brethren in passing it is only fair to point out that though only the other day it was in the days ere scenario writers became respectable in the days when they worked overtime for roughneck directors for fifteen and twenty a week or freelanced their wares for from ten to twenty dollars per scenario and half the time were beaten out of the due payment or had their stolen goods stolen from them by their equally graceless and shameless fellows who slaved by the week but to-day which is only a day since the other day i know scenario writers who keep their three machines their two chauffeurs send their children to the most exclusive prep schools and maintain an unwavering solvency it was largely because of the shortage in raw material that scenario writers appreciated in value and esteem they found themselves in demand treated with respect better remunerated and in return expected to deliver a higher grade of commodity one phase of this new quest for material was the attempt to enlist known authors in the work but because a man had written a score of novels was no guarantee that he could write a good scenario quite to the contrary it was quickly discovered that the surest guarantee of failure was a previous record of success in novel writing but the moving pictures producers were not to be denied division of labor was the thing allying themselves with powerful newspaper organizations or in the case of hearts of three the very reverse they had highly skilled writers of scenario who couldn't write novels to save themselves make scenarios which in turn were translated into novels by novel writers who couldn't to save themselves write scenarios comes now mr charles goddard to one jack london saying the time the place and the men are met the moving pictures producers the newspapers and the capital are ready let us get together and we got result hearts of three when i state that mr goddard has been responsible for the perils of pauline the exploits of elaine the goddess the get rich quick wallingford series etc no question of his skilled fitness can be raised also the name of the present heroine 
Leoncia, is of his own devising. On the ranch, in the Valley of the Moon, he wrote his first several episodes, but he wrote faster than I, and was done with his fifteen episodes weeks ahead of me. Do not be misled by the word episode. The first episode covers three thousand feet of film. The succeeding fourteen episodes cover each two thousand feet of film, and each episode contains about ninety scenes, which makes a total of some thirteen hundred scenes. Nevertheless, we worked simultaneously at our respective tasks. I could not build for what was going to happen next or a dozen chapters away because I did not know. Neither did Mr. Goddard know. The inevitable result was that hearts of three may not be very vertebrate, although it is certainly consecutive. Imagine my surprise, down here in Hawaii and toiling at the novelization of the tenth episode, to receive by mail from Mr. Goddard in New York the scenario of the fourteenth episode, and glancing therein, to find my hero married to the wrong woman." and with only one more episode in which to get rid of the wrong woman and duly tie my hero up with the right and only woman. For all of which, please see last chapter of 15th episode. Trust Mr. Goddard to show me how. For Mr. Goddard is the master of action and lord of speed. Action doesn't bother him at all. Register, he calmly says in a film direction to the moving picture actor. Evidently, the actor registers, for Mr. Goddard goes right on with more action. Register grief, he commands, or sorrow, or anger, or melting sympathy, or homicidal intent, or suicidal tendency. That's all. It has to be all, or else how would he ever accomplish the whole 1,300 scenes? But imagine the poor devil of a me who can't utter the talismanic register, but who must describe and at some length inevitably, these moods and modes so airily created in passing by Mr. Goddard. Why, Dickens thought nothing of consuming a thousand words or so in describing and subtly characterizing the particular grief of a particular person. But Mr. Goddard says, register, and the slaves of the camera obey. And action! I have written some novels of adventure in my time, but never in all of the many of them have I perpetrated a totality of action equal to what is contained in Hearts of Three. But I know now why moving pictures are popular. I know now why Messrs. Barnes of New York and Potter of Texas sold by the millions of copies. I know now why one stump speech of highfalutin is a more efficient vote-getter than a finest and highest act or thought of statesmanship. It has been an interesting experience, this novelization by me of Mr. Goddard's scenario, and it has been instructive. It has given me highlights, foundation lines, cross-bearings, and illumination on my anciently founded sociological generalizations. I have come by this adventure in writing to understand the mass mind of the people more thoroughly than I thought I had understood it before, and to realize, more fully than ever, the graphic entertainment delivered by the demagogue who wins the vote of the mass out of his mastery of its mind. I should be surprised if this book does not have a large sale. Register surprise, Mr. Goddard would say, or register large sale. If this adventure of hearts of three be collaboration, I am transported by it. But alack, I fear me Mr. Goddard must then be the one collaborator in a million. We have never had a word, an argument, nor a discussion. But then I must be a jewel of a collaborator myself. Have I not, without whisper or whimper of complaint, let him register through fifteen episodes of scenario, through 1,300 scenes and 31,000 feet of film, through 111,000 words of novelization? Just the same, having completed the task, I wish I'd never written it, for the reason that I'd like to read it myself to see if it reads along. I am curious to know. I am curious to know. Jack London, Waikiki, Hawaii, March 23, 1916 End of Forward Cast of Characters for Hearts of Three by Jack London Narration by Lynette Calkins Francis Morgan Read by John Warren Hart
Henry Morgan, read by Benjamin Tucker. Leoncia, read by Krista Zaleski. Parker, read by Jim Hedrick. Thomas Regan, read by John Payton. Senor Alvarez Torres, read by Wayne Cook. Senor Mariano Vercara e Hijos, Jefe Politico, read by Greg Giordano. Enrico Solano, read by Todd. Alessandro Solano, read by Ted Perkins. Martinez Solano, read by Red Run. Alvarado Solano, read by Andrew Gantz. Ricardo Solano, read by Inko. Solano Maid and Servants. Eileen Ellen. David Purdy. John Cannot. Mayan Lad, read by Elijah Fisher. Captain Trefathan, read by Max Magnus. Percival, read by John Cannot. Trefathan Sailor. Read by David Purdy. Caribs. You sing. John Kenner. David Purdy. Pedro Surita by Scott Calkins. Raphael. Read by Elsie Selwyn. Ignacio. Read by Joe Bergen. Augustino. Read by Bill Mosley. And Army. Read by Red Run. Old Buccaneer Morgan, read by John Kennard. Capitan Rosaro, read by Bill Mosley. Huchitan Haciendado, read by Inco. Haciendado Dos, read by Major Tost. Haciendado Three, read by David Purdy. Overseer Ramirez, read by Red Run. Vicente, read by Major Tost. Guillermo, read by John Kennard. Oil Man, read by Arcas 27. Beleaguered Peon, read by Beeswax Scandal. The Blind Brigand, read by Larry Wilson. Blind One's Daughter, read by Eliza. Blind One's Leader, read by Joe Bergen. Old Maya, read by Sonia. Jose Manchino, read by Adrian Stevens. Carew, read by David Purdy. Panamanian Judge, read by John Kennard. Lieutenant Parsons, read by Todd. Priest of the Sun, read by Jim Hedrick. Daughter of the Sun Priest, read by Marie Christian. Sun Queen, read by Jen Broda. Lost Souls of the Hidden People. Christine G. Christine Bowden. John Cannard. Michelle Eaton. Nicoya. Read by Susan K. Concordia. Read by Marie Christian. Canoe Jose. Read by Elijah Fisher. Canoe Indian. Read by John Cannard. Rodriguez Fernandez. Read by Scotty Smith. Ye Poon. Read by Wayne Cook. Bascom, read by Greg Giordano. Johnny Pathmore, read by Bill Mosley. Old Wreck, read by Adrian Stevens. Broken Woman, read by Don Sutton. Peter McGill, read by Archives 27. Charlie Tippery, read by Elsie Selwyn. Newspaper Peddler, read by David Purdy. Police Lieutenant Burns, read by Scott Calkins. Bear Broker, read by Bees by Scandal. End of Cast of Characters for Hearts of Three by Jack London. End of Formatter. Epigram and Chapter One of Hearts of Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hearts of Three by Jack London Back to Back Against the Mainmast Do ye seek for fun and fortune? 
Listen, rovers, now to me. Look ye for them on the ocean, ye shall find them on the sea. Roaring wind and deep blue water, we're the jolly devils who, back to back against the mainmast, held at bay the entire crew. Bring the dagger, bring the pistols, we will have our own today. Let the cannon smash the bulwarks, let the cutlass clear the way. Roaring wind and deep blue water, we're the jolly devils who, back to back against the mainmast, held at bay the entire crew. Here's to rum and here's to plunder, here's to all the gales that blow. Let the seamen cry for mercy, let the blood of captains flow. Roaring wind and deep blue water, we're the jolly devils who, back to back against the mainmast, held at bay the entire crew. Here's to ships that we have taken, they have seen which men were best. We have lifted maids and cargo, and the sharks have had the rest. Roaring wind and deep blue water, we're the jolly devils who, back to back against the mainmast, held at bay the entire crew. George Sterling Hearts of Three Chapter One Events happened very rapidly with Francis Morgan that late spring morning. If ever a man leaped across time into the raw, red drama and tragedy of the primitive and the medieval melodrama of sentiment and passion of the New World Latin, Francis Morgan was destined to be that man, and destiny was very immediate upon him. Yet he was lazily unaware that aught in the world was stirring, and was scarcely astir himself. A late night at bridge had necessitated a late rising. A late breakfast of fruit and cereal had occurred along the route to the library, the austerely elegant room from which his father, toward the last, had directed vast and manifold affairs. Parker, he said to the valet who had been his father's before him, did you ever notice any signs of fat on R.H.M. in his last days? Oh, no, sir, was the answer, uttered with all the due humility of the trained servant, but accompanied by an involuntarily measuring glance that scanned the young man's splendid proportions. Your father, sir, never lost his leanness. His figure was always the same, broad-shouldered, deep in the chest, big-boned, but lean— always lean, sir, in the middle. When he was laid out, sir, and bathed, his body would have shamed most of the young men about town. He always took good care of himself. It was those exercises in bed, sir, half an hour every morning, nothing prevented. He called it religion. Yes, he was a fine figure of a man. The young man responded idly, glancing to the stock ticker and the several telephones his father had installed. He was that, Parker agreed eagerly. He was lean and aristocratic in spite of his shoulders and bone and chest, and you've inherited it, sir, only on more generous lines. Young Francis Morgan, inheritor of many millions as well as brawn, lolled back luxuriously in a huge leather chair, stretched his legs after the manner of a full-vigored menagerie lion that is overspilling with vigor, and glanced at a headline of the morning paper which informed him of a fresh slide in the Culebra cut at Panama. "'If I didn't know we Morgans didn't run that way,' he yawned, "'I'd be fat already from this existence, hey, Parker?' The elderly valet, who had neglected prompt reply, startled at the abrupt interrogative interruption of the pause. "'Oh, yes, sir,' he said hastily. "'I mean, no, sir. You are in the pink of condition.' "'Not on your life,' the young man assured him. "'I may not be getting fat, but I am certainly growing soft, eh, Parker?' "'Yes, sir. No, sir. No, I mean, no, sir.' You are just the same as when you came home from college three years ago. And took up loafing as a vocation. <laughs> Francis laughed. Parker. Parker was alert attention. His master debated with himself ponderously, as if the problem were of profound importance, 
rubbing the while the bristly thatch of the small toothbrush moustache he had recently begun to sport on his upper lip. Parker, I'm going fishing. Yes, sir. I ordered some rods sent up. Please joint them and let me give them the once-over. The idea just threw my mind that two weeks in the woods is what I need. If I don't, I'll surely start laying on flesh and disgrace the whole family tree. You remember Sir Henry? The old original Sir Henry? The buccaneer, old swashbuckler? Yes, sir. I've read of him, sir. Parker had paused in the doorway until such time as the ebbing of his young master's volubility would permit him to depart on the errand. Nothing to be proud of, the old pirate. Oh, no, sir, Parker protested. He was governor of Jamaica. He died respected. It was a mercy he didn't die hanged. <laughs> Francis laughed. As it was, he's the only disgrace in the family that he founded. But what I was going to say is that I've looked him up very carefully. He kept his figure, and he died lean in the middle, thank God. It's a good inheritance he passed down. We Morgans never found his treasure, but beyond rubies is the lean in the middle legacy he bequeathed us. It's what is called a fixed character in the breed. That's what the profs taught me in the biology course. Parker faded out of the room in the ensuing silence, during which Francis Morgan buried himself in the Panama column and learned that the canal was not expected to be open for traffic for three weeks to come. A telephone buzzed, and through the electric nerves of a consummate civilization, destiny made the first outreach of its tentacles and contacted with Francis Morgan in the library of the mansion his father had builded on Riverside Drive. "'But my dear Mrs. Carruthers,' was his protest into the transmitter. "'Whatever it is, it is a mere local flurry. Tampico Petroleum is all right. It is not a gambling proposition. It is legitimate investment. Stay with, tie to it.' Some Minnesota farmer's come to town and is trying to buy a block or two because it looks as solid as it really is. What if it is up two points? Don't sell. Tampico Petroleum is not a lottery or a roulette proposition. It's bona fide industry. I wish it hadn't been so almighty big or I'd have financed it all myself. Listen, please, it's not a flyer. Our present contracts for tanks is over a million. Our railroad and our three pipelines are costing more than five millions. Why, we've a hundred millions in producing wells right now, and our problem is to get it down country to the oil steamers. This is the sober investment time. A year from now, or two years, and your shares will make government bonds look like something the cat brought in. Yes. Yes, please. Never mind how the market goes. Also, please... I didn't advise you to go in in the first place. I never advised a friend to that. But now that they are in, stick. It's as solid as the Bank of England. Yes, Dickie and I divided the spoils last night. Lovely party, though Dickie's got too much temperament for bridge. Yes, bull luck. <laughs> My temperament. <laughs> yes. Tell Harry I'm off and away for a couple of weeks. Fishing, troutlets, you know, the springtime and the streams, the rise of sap, the budding and the blossoming and all the rest. Yes, goodbye, and hold on to Tampico Petroleum. If it goes down after that Minnesota farmer's bulled it, buy a little more. I'm going to. It's finding money. Yes, yes, surely. It's too good to dare sell on a flyer now, because it mayn't ever go down again. Of course I know what I'm talking about. I've just had eight hours sleep and haven't had a drink. Yes, yes, goodbye. He pulled the ticker tape into the comfort of his chair and languidly ran over it, noting with mildly growing interest the message it conveyed. Parker returned with several slender rods, each a glittering gem of artisanship and art. Francis was out of his chair, Ticker flung aside and forgotten, as with the exultant joy of a boy he examined the toys, and, one after another, began trying them, 
switching them through the air till they made shrill whip-like noises moving them gently with prudence and precision under the lofty ceiling as he made believe to cast across the floor into some unseen pool of trout-lurking mystery a telephone buzzed irritation was swift on his face for heaven's sake answer it parker he commanded if it is some silly stock gambling female tell her i'm dead or, or drunk or down with typhoid or getting married or anything calamitous after a moment's dialogue conducted on parker's part in the discreet and modulated tones that befitted absolutely the cool chaste noble dignity of the room with a one moment sir into the transmitter he muffled the transmitter with his hand and said it's mr bascom sir he wants you tell mr bascom to go to hell said francis simulating so long a cast that had it been in verity a cast and had it pursued the course his fascinated gaze indicated it would have gone through the window and most likely startled the gardener outside kneeling over the rose-bush he was planting mr bascom says it's about the market sir and that he'd like to talk with you only a moment parker urged but so delicately and subduedly as to seem to be merely repeating an immaterial and unnecessary message all right francis carefully leaned the rod against a table and went to the phone hello he said into the telephone yes this is i morgan shoot what is it he listened for a minute then interrupted irritably sell hell nothing of the sort of course i'm glad to know even if it goes up ten points which it won't hold on to everything it may be a legitimate rise and it mayn't ever come down it's solid it's worth far more than it's listed i know if the public doesn't a year from now it'll list at two hundred that is if mexico can cut the revolution stuff whenever it drops you'll have buying orders from me nonsense who wants control it's purely sporadic eh i beg your pardon i mean it's merely temporary now i'm going off fishing for a fortnight if it goes down five points buy buy all that's offered say when a fellow's got a real bona fide property being bold is almost as bad as having the bears after one yes sure yes good-bye and while francis returned delightedly to his fishing rods destiny in thomas regan's downtown private office was working overtime having arranged with his various brokers to buy and through his diverse channels of secret publicity having let slip the cryptic tip that something was wrong with tampico petroleum's concessions from the mexican government thomas regan studied a report of his own oil expert emissary who had spent two months on the spot spying out what tampico petroleum really had in sight and prospect a clerk brought in a card with the information that the visitor was importunate and foreign regan listened glanced at the card and said tell this mr senor alvarez torres of cuidad de colon that i can't see him Five minutes later, the clerk was back, this time with a message penciled on the card. Regan grinned as he read it. Dear Mr. Regan, Honored Sir, I have the honor to inform you that I have a tip on the location of the treasure Sir Henry Morgan buried in old pirate days. Alvarez Torres. Regan shook his head and the clerk was nearly out of the room when his employer suddenly recalled him show him in at once in the interval of being alone regan chuckled to himself as he rolled the new idea over in his mind <laughs> he unlicked cub he muttered through the smoke of the cigar he was lighting thinks he can play the lion part old r h m played <laughs> trimming is what he needs and old gray-beard thomas r will see that he gets it senor alvarez torres's english was as correct as his modish spring suit 
and though the bleached yellow of his skin advertised his latin american origin and though his black eyes were eloquent of the mixed lustres of spanish and indian long compounded nevertheless he was as thoroughly new yorkish as thomas regan could have wished by great effort and years of research i have finally won to the clue to the buccaneer gold of sir henry morgan he preambled of course it is on the mosquito coast i tell you now that it is not a thousand miles from jerique lagoon and that bocas del toro within reason may be described as the nearest town i was born there educated in paris however and i know the neighborhood like a book a small schooner the outlay is cheap most very cheap but the returns the reward the treasure Senor Torres paused in eloquent inability to describe more definitely, and Thomas Regan, hard man, used to dealing with hard men, proceeded to bore into him and his data like a cross-examining criminal lawyer. Yes, Senor Torres quickly admitted. I am somewhat embarrassed. Uh, how shall I say, for immediate funds? You need the money the stock operator assured him brutally and he bowed pained acquiescence much more he admitted under the rapid-fire interrogation it was true he had but recently left bocas del toro but he hoped never again to go back and yet he would go back if possibly some arrangement but regan shut him off with the abrupt way of the master man dealing with lesser fellow-creatures he wrote a check in the name of alvarez torres and when that gentleman glanced at it he read the figures of a thousand dollars now here's the idea said regan i put no belief whatsoever in your story but i have a young friend my heart is bound up in the boy but he is too much about town the white lights and the white lighted ladies and the rest you understand and Senor Alvarez Torres bowed as one man of the world to another. Now for the good of his health, as well as his wealth and the saving of his soul, the best thing that could happen to him is a trip after treasure, adventure, exercise, and you readily understand, I'm sure. Again Alvarez Torres bowed. You need the money. Regan continued strive to interest him that thousand is for your effort succeed in interesting him so that he departs after old morgan's gold and two thousand more is yours so thoroughly succeed in interesting him that he remains away three months two thousand more six months five thousand oh believe me i knew his father we were comrades partners i I might say almost brothers. I would sacrifice any sum to win his son to manhood's wholesome path. What do you say? The thousand is yours to begin with. Well? With trembling fingers, Senor Alvarez Torres folded and unfolded the check. I, I accept it. He stammered and faltered in his eagerness. I, I, how shall I say I am yours to command. Five minutes later, as he arose to go, fully instructed in the part he was to play, and with his story of Morgan's treasure revised to convincingness by the brass tack business acumen of the stock gambler, he blurted out, almost facetiously, yet even more pathetically, And the funniest thing about it, Mr. Regan, is that it is true. Your advice changes in my narrative make it sound more true, but true it is under it all. I need the money. You are most munificent, and I shall do my best. I, I pride myself that I am an artist. But the real and solemn truth is that the clue to Morgan's buried loot is genuine. I have had access to records inaccessible to the public, which is neither here nor there, for the men of my own family, their family records, have had similar access, 
and have wasted their lives before me in a futile search. Yet were they on the right clue, except that their wits made them miss the spot by twenty miles. It was there in the records. They missed it because it was, I think, a deliberate trick, a conundrum, a, a puzzle, a, a disguisement, a maze, which I and I alone have penetrated and solved. The other navigators all played such tricks on the chart straight through. My Spanish race, so hid the Hawaiian Islands by five degrees of longitude. All of which was, in turn, Greek to Thomas Regan, who smiled his acceptance of listening, and with the same smile conveyed his busy businessman's tolerant unbelief. Scarcely was Senor Torres gone when Francis Morgan was shown in. Just thought I'd drop around for a bit of counsel, he said, greetings over. And to whom but you should I apply, who so closely played the game with my father? You and he were partners, I understand, on some of the biggest deals. He always told me to trust your judgment. And, well, here I am, and I want to go fishing. What's up with Tampico Petroleum? What is up? Regan countered with fine simulation of ignorance of the very thing of moment he was responsible for precipitating. Tampico Petroleum? Francis nodded, dropped into a chair, and lighted a cigarette, while Regan consulted the ticker. Uh, Tampico Petroleum is up. Two points. You should worry. He opined. That's what I say. Francis concurred. I should worry. But just the same, do you think some bunch, onto the inside value of it, and it's big, I speak under the rose, you know, I mean in absolute confidence. Regan nodded. It is big. It is right. It is the real thing. It is legitimate. Now this activity, would you think that somebody or some bunch is trying to get control? His father's associate, with the reverend gray of hair thatching his roof of crooked brain, shook the thatch. Why? He amplified. It may be just a flurry, or it may be a hunch on the stock public that it's really good. What do you say? Of course it's good, was Francis's warm response. I've got reports, Regan. So good they'll make your hair stand up. And as I tell all my friends, this is the real legitimate. It's a damn shame I had to let the public in on it. It was so big, I just had to. Even all the money my father left me couldn't swing it. I mean, free money, not the stuff tied up. Money to work with. Are you short? The older man queried. Oh, I've got a tidy bit to operate with, was the airy reply of youth. You mean? Sure, just that. If she drops, I'll buy. It's finding money. Just about how far would you buy? was the next searching interrogation, masked by an expression of mingled good humor and approbation. All I've got, came Francis Morgan's prompt answer. I tell you, Regan, it's immense. I haven't looked into it to amount to anything, Francis, but I will say from the little I know that it listens good. Listens? I tell you, Regan, it's the Simon Pure straight legitimate, and it's a shame to have it listed at all. I don't have to wreck anybody or anything to pull it across. The world will be better for my shooting into it, I'm afraid to say, how many hundreds of millions of barrels of real oil. Say, I've got one well alone in the Huesteca field that's gushed 27,000 barrels a day for seven months, and it's still doing it. That's the drop in the bucket we've got piped to market now, and it's 22 gravity and carries less than two-tenths of one percent of sediment. And there's one gusher, 60 miles of pipe to build it, and pinch down to the limit of safety that's pouring out all over the landscape just about 70,000 barrels a day. Of course, all in confidence, you know. We're doing nicely, and I don't want Tampico Petroleum to skyrocket. Don't you worry about that, my lad. You've got to get your oil piped, and the Mexican Revolution straightened out before ever Tampico Petroleum soars. You go fishing, and forget it. 
Regan paused with finely simulated sudden recollection and picked up Alvarez Torres's card with the penciled note. Look who's just been to see me. Apparently struck with an idea, Regan retained the card a moment. Why go fishing for mere trout? After all, it's only recreation. Here's a thing to go fishing after that there's real recreation in. Full-size man's recreation, and not the Persian palace recreation of an Adirondack camp with ice and servants and electric push-buttons. Your father always was more than a mite proud of that old family pirate. He claimed to look like him, and you certainly look like your dad. Sir Henry. Francis smiled, reaching for the card. So am I a mite proud of the old scoundrel. He looked up questioningly from the reading of the card. He's a plausible cuss, Regan explained. Claims to have been born right down there on the Mosquito Coast, and to have got the tip from private papers in his family. Not that I believe a word of it. I haven't time or interest to get started believing in stuff outside my own field. Just the same, Sir Henry died practically a poor man. Francis asserted, the lines of the Morgan stubbornness knitting themselves for a flash on his brows. And they never did find any of his buried treasure. Good fishing, Regan girded good-humouredly. I'd like to meet this Alvarez Torres just the same, the young man responded. Fool's gold, Regan continued. Though, I must admit that the cuss is most exasperatingly plausible. Why, well, if I were younger, but oh, the devil, my work's cut out for me here. Do you know where I can find him? Francis was asking the next moment, all unwittingly putting his neck into the net of tentacles that destiny, in the visible incarnation of Thomas Regan, was casting out to snare him. The next morning, the meeting took place in Regan's office. Senor Alvarez Torres startled and controlled himself at first sight of Francis's face. This was not missed by Regan, who grinningly demanded, Looks like the old pirate himself, eh? Yes, the resemblance is most striking. Torres lied, or half lied, for he did recognize the resemblance to the portraits he had seen of Sir Henry Morgan, although at the same time, under his eyelids, he saw the vision of another and living man, who, no less than Francis and Sir Henry, looked as much like both of them as either looked like the other. Francis was youth that was not to be denied. Modern maps and ancient charts were poured over, as well as old documents, handwritten in faded ink on time-yellowed paper. And at the end of a half an hour, he announced that the next fish he caught would be on either the bull or the calf, the two islets off the lagoon of Chiriqui, on one or the other of which Torres Aberd the treasure lay. I'll catch tonight's train for New Orleans, Francis announced. That will just make connection with one of the United Fruit Company's boats for Cologne. Oh, I had it all looked up before I slept last night. But don't charter a schooner in Cologne, Torres advised. Take the overland trip by horseback to Berlin. There's the place to charter with unsophisticated native sailors and everything else unsophisticated. Listen's good, Francis agreed. I always wanted to see that country down there. You'll be ready to catch tonight's train, Senor Torres? Of course, you understand, under the circumstances, I'll be the treasurer and foot the expenses. But at a privy glance from Regan, Alvarez Torres lied with swift efficientness. I must join you later, I regret, Mr. Morgan. Uh, some little business depresses, uh, how shall I say, uh, an insignificant little lawsuit that must be settled first. Not that the summit issue is important, but uh, it is a family matter, uh, and therefore gravely important. Uh, we Torres have our pride, uh, which is a silly thing I acknowledge in this country, uh, but which with us is very serious. 
He can join afterward and straighten you out if you've missed the scent. Regan assured Francis. And before it slips your mind, it might be just as well to arrange with Senor Torres some division of the loot, if you ever find it. What would you say? Francis asked. Equal division. Fifty-fifty. Regan answered, magnificently arranging the apportionment between the two men of something he was certain did not exist. And you will follow after as soon as you can? Francis asked the Latin American. Regan, take hold of his little law affair yourself and expedite it, won't you? Sure, boy, was the answer. And if it's needed, shall I advance cash to Senor Alvarez? Fine. Francis shook their hands in both of his. It will save me bother. And I've got to rush to pack and break engagements and catch that train. So long, Regan. Goodbye, Senor Torres, until we meet somewhere around Bocas del Toro, or in a little hole in the ground on the bull or the calf. You say you think it's the calf? Well, until then, adios. And Senor Alvarez Torres remained with Regan some time longer, receiving explicit instructions for the part he was to play beginning with retardation and delay of Francis's expedition, and culminating in similar retardation and delay, always to be continued. In short, Regan concluded, I don't almost care if he never comes back. If you can keep him down there for the good of his health that long, and longer. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Hearts of Three by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Money, like youth, will not be denied, and Francis Morgan, who was the man legal and nature certain representative of both youth and money, found himself one afternoon, three weeks after he had said goodbye to Regan, becalmed close under the land on board his schooner, the Angelique. The water was glassy, the smooth roll scarcely perceptible, and in sheer ennui and overplus of energy that likewise declined to be denied, he asked the captain, a breed half Jamaica Negro and half Indian, to order a small skiff over the side. Looks like I might shoot a parrot or a monkey or something, he explained, searching the jungle-clad shore half a mile away through a twelve-power Zeiss glass. Most problematic, sir, that you are bitten by a labari, which is deadly viper in these parts, grinned the breed skipper and owner of the Angelique, who, from his Jamaica father, had inherited the gift of tongues. But Francis was not to be deterred, for at the moment, through his glass, he had picked out, first, in the middle ground, a white hacienda, and second, on the beach, a white-clad woman's form and further had seen that she was scrutinizing him and the schooner through a pair of binoculars. Put the skiff over, Skipper, he ordered. Who lives around here? White folks? The Enrico Solano family, sir, was the answer. My word, they are important gentlefolk, old Spanish, and they own the entire general landscape from the sea to the Cordilleras and half of the Chiquiri Lagoon as well. They are very poor, most powerful rich in landscape, and they are prideful and fiery as cayenne pepper. As Francis, in the tiny skiff, rode shoreward, the skipper's alert eye noted that he had neglected to take along either rifle or shotgun for the contemplated parrot or monkey. And next, the skipper's eye picked up the white-clad woman's figure against the dark edge of the jungle. Straight to the white beach of coral sand, Francis rode, not trusting himself to look over his shoulder to see if the woman remained or had vanished. In his mind was merely a young man's healthy idea of encountering a bucolic young lady, or a half-wild white woman for that matter, or at the best a very provincial one, with whom he could fool and fun away a few minutes of the calm that fettered the Angelique to immobility. When the skiff grounded, he stepped out, 
and with one sturdy arm lifted its nose high enough up the sand to fasten it by its own weight. Then he turned around. The beach to the jungle was bare. He strode forward confidently. Any traveler on so strange a shore had a right to seek inhabitants for information on his way, was the idea he was acting out. And he, who had anticipated a few moments of diversion merely, was diverted beyond his fondest expectations. Like a jack-in-the-box, the woman, who in the flash of vision vouchsafed him, demonstrated that she was a girl-woman, ripely mature and yet mostly girl, sprang out of the green wall of jungle and with both hands seized his arm. The heavy weight of grip in the seizure surprised him. He fumbled his hat off with his free hand and bowed to the strange woman with the imperturbableness of a Morgan, New York trained and disciplined to be surprised at nothing, and received another surprise, or several surprises compounded. Not alone was it her semi-brunette beauty that impacted upon him with the weight of a blow, but it was her gaze driven into him that was all of sternness. Almost it seemed to him that he must know her. Strangers, in his experience, never looked so at one another. The double grip on his arm became a draw as she muttered tensely, Quick, follow me. A moment he resisted. She shook him in the fervor of her desire and strove to pull him toward her and after her. With the feeling that it was some unusual game, such as one might meet up with on the coast of Central America, he yielded smilingly, scarcely knowing whether he followed voluntarily or was being dragged into the jungle by her impetuosity. Do as I do. She shot back at him over her shoulder, by this time leading him with one hand of hers in his. He smiled and obeyed, crouching when she crouched, doubling over when she doubled, while memories of John Smith and Pocahontas glimmered up in his fancy. Abruptly, she checked him and sat down, her hand directing him to sit beside her ere she released him, and pressed it to her heart while she panted, Thank God, oh merciful virgin! In imitation, such having been her will of him, and such seeming to be the cue of the game, he smilingly pressed his own hand to his heart, although he called neither on God nor the Virgin. Won't you ever be serious? She flashed at him, noting his action. And Francis was immediately and profoundly, as well as naturally, serious. My dear lady, he began. But an abrupt gesture checked him, and, with growing wonder, he watched her bend and listen, and heard the movement of bodies padding down some runway several yards away. With a soft, warm palm pressed commandingly to his to be silent, she left him with the abruptness that he had already come to consider as customary with her, and slipped away down the runway. Almost he whistled with astonishment. He might have whistled it had he not heard her voice, not distant, in Spanish, sharply interrogate men whose Spanish voices, half humbly, half insistently, and half rebelliously, answered her. He heard them move on, still talking, and after five minutes of dead silence, heard her call for him peremptorily to come out. Gee, I wonder what Regan would do under such circumstances. He smiled to himself as he obeyed. He followed her, no longer hand in hand, through the jungle to the beach. When she paused, he came beside her and faced her, still under the impress of the fantasy which possessed him that it was a game. Tag! He laughed, touching her on the shoulder. Tag! He reiterated. You're it! The anger of her blazing dark eyes scorched him. You fool! she cried, lifting her finger with what he considered undue intimacy to his toothbrush mustache. As if that could disguise you. But, my dear lady, he began to protest his certain unacquaintance with her. Her retort, which broke off his speech, was as unreal and bizarre as everything else which had gone before. So quick was it that he failed to see whence the tiny silver revolver had been drawn 
the muzzle of which was not presented merely toward his abdomen, but pressed closely against it. My dear lady, he tried again. I won't talk with you, she shut him off. Go back to your schooner and go away. He guessed the inaudible sob of the pause ere she concluded, Forever. This time his mouth opened to speech that was aborted on his lips by the stiff thrust of the muzzle of the weapon into his abdomen. If you ever come back, the Madonna forgive me, I shall shoot myself. Guess I'd better go then. He uttered airily as he turned to the skiff, toward which he walked in stately embarrassment, half filled with laughter for himself and for the ridiculous and incomprehensible figure he was cutting. Endeavoring to retain a last shred of dignity, he took no notice that she had followed him. As he lifted the skiff's nose from the sand, he was aware that a faint wind was rustling the palm fronds. A long breeze was darkening the water close at hand, while far out across the mirrored water the outlying keys of Chiriki Lagoon shimmered like a mirage above the dark, crisping water. A sob compelled him to desist from stepping into the skiff and to turn his head. The strange young woman, revolver dropped to her side, was crying. His step back to her was instant, and the touch of his hand on her arm was sympathetic and inquiring. She shuddered at his touch, drew away from him, and gazed at him reproachfully through her tears. With a shrug of shoulders to her many moods and of surrender to the incomprehensibleness of the situation, he was about to turn to the boat when she stopped him. At least you, she began, then faltered and swallowed. You might kiss me goodbye. She advanced impulsively with outstretched arms, the revolver dangling incongruously from her right hand. Francis hesitated a puzzled moment, then gathered her in to receive an astounding, passionate kiss on his lips ere she dropped her head on his shoulder in a breakdown of tears. Despite his amazement, he was aware of the revolver pressing flatwise against his back between the shoulders. She lifted her tear-wet face and kissed him again and again, and he wondered to himself if he were a cad for meeting her kisses with almost equal and fully as mysterious impulsiveness. With a feeling that he did not in the least care how long the tender episode might last, he was startled by her quick drawing away from him as anger and contempt blazed back in her face, and as she menacingly directed him with the revolver to get into the boat. He shrugged his shoulders as if to say that he could not say no to a lovely lady, and obeyed, sitting to the oars and facing her as he began rowing away. The Virgin save me from my wayward heart, she cried, with her free hand tearing a locket from her bosom, and in a shower of golden beads, flinging the ornament into the waterway midway between them. From the edge of the jungle he saw three men, armed with rifles, run toward her where she had sunk down in the sand. In the midst of lifting her up, they caught sight of Francis, who had begun rowing a strong stroke. Over his shoulder he glimpsed the Angelique, close-hauled and slightly heeling, cutting through the water toward him. The next moment, one of the trio on the beach, a bearded elderly man, was directing the girl's binoculars on him, and the moment after, dropping the glasses, he was taking aim with his rifle. The bullet spat on the water within a yard of the skiff's side, and Frances saw the girl spring to her feet, knock up the rifle with her arm, and spoil the second shot. Next, pulling lustily, he saw the men separate from her to sight their rifles, and saw her threatening them with the revolver into lowering their weapons. The Angelique, thrown up into the wind to stop way, foamed alongside, and with an agile leap, Francis was aboard, while already, the skipper putting the wheel up, the schooner was paying off and filling. With boyish zest, Francis wafted a kiss of farewell to the girl, who was staring toward him, and saw her collapse on the shoulders of the bearded elderly man. Guy and Peppa, eh? Dos damn horrible, crazy, proud solanos. 
The breed skipper flashed at Francis with white teeth of laughter. Just bugs. Clean crazy. Nobody at home. Francis laughed back as he sprang to the rail to waft further kisses to the strange damsel. Before the land wind, the Angelique made the outer rim of Chiriki Lagoon, and the bull and the calf, some fifty miles further along the rim, by midnight, when the skipper hove to to wait for daylight. After breakfast, rowed by a Jamaica Negro sailor in the skiff, Francis landed to reconnoiter on the bull, which was the larger island and which the skipper had told him he might find occupied at that season of the year by turtle-catching Indians from the mainland. And Francis very immediately found that he had traversed not merely thirty degrees of latitude from New York, but thirty hundred years, or centuries for that matter, from the last word of civilization to almost the first word of the primeval. Naked except for breech clouts of gunny sacking, armed with cruelly heavy hacking blades of machetes, the turtle catchers were swift in proving themselves errant beggars and dangerous man killers. The bull belonged to them, they told him through the medium of his Jamaican sailors interpreting, but the calf, which used to belong to them for the turtle season, now was possessed by a madly impossible gringo, whose reckless, dominating ways had won from them the respect of fear for a two-legged human creature who was more fearful than themselves. While Francis, with a silver dollar, dispatched one of them with a message to the mysterious gringo that he desired to call on him, the rest of them clustered about Francis's skiff, whining for money, glowering upon him, and even impudently stealing his pipe, yet warm from his lips, which he had laid beside him in the stern sheets. Promptly he had laid a blow on the ear of the thief, and the next thief who seized it, and recovered the pipe. Machetes out and sun-glistening their clean-slicing menace, Francis covered and controlled the gang with an automatic pistol, and while they drew apart in a groove, and whispered ominously, he made the discovery that his lone sailor interpreter was a weak brother and received his return messenger. The negro went over to the turtle catchers and talked with a friendliness and subservience, the tones of which Francis did not like. The messenger handed him his note, across which was scrawled in pencil, Vamos. Guess I'll have to go across myself. Francis told the negro whom he had beckoned back to him. Better be very careful and at mostly cautious, sir, the negro warned him. These animals without reason are very problematically likely to act most unreasonably, sir. Get into the boat and row me over, Francis commanded shortly. No, sir, I regret much to say, sir, was the black sailor's answer. I signed on, sir, as a sailor to Captain Drevetan, but I didn't sign on for no suicide, and I can't see my way to rowing you over, sir, to certain death. Best thing we can do is to get out of this hard place that certainly, and without peradventure of a doubt, going to get hotter for us if we remain, sir. In huge disgust and scorn, Francis pocketed his automatic, turned his back on the sacking-clad savages, and walked away through the palms, where a great boulder of coral rock had been upthrust by some ancient restlessness of the earth, he came down to the beach. On the shore of the calf, across the narrow channel, he made out a dinghy drawn up. Drawn up on his own side was a crank-looking and manifestly leaky dugout canoe. As he tilted the water out of it, he noticed that the turtle catchers had followed and were peering at him from the edge of the coconuts, though his weak-hearted sailor was not in sight. To paddle across the channel was a matter of moments, but scarcely was he on the beach of the calf when further in hospitality greeted him on the part of a tall, barefooted young man who stepped from behind a palm, automatic pistol in hand, and shouted, Vamoose! Get out! Scott! Ye gods and little fishes! 
Francis grinned, half humorously, half seriously. A fellow can't move in these parts without having a gun shoved in his face. And everybody says, get out pronto. Nobody invited you, the stranger retorted. You're intruding. Get off my island. I'll give you half a minute. I'm getting sore, friend, Francis assured him truthfully, at the same time, out of the corner of his eye, measuring the distance to the nearest palm trunk. Everybody I meet around here is crazy and discourteous and peevishly anxious to be rid of my presence, and they've just got me feeling that way myself. Besides, just because you tell me it's your island is no proof. The swift rush he made to the shelter of the palm left his sentence unfinished. His arrival behind the trunk was simultaneous with the arrival of a bullet that thudded into the other side of it. Now, just for that, he called out as he centered a bullet into the trunk of the other man's palm. The next few minutes they blazed away or waited for calculated shots. And when Francis's eighth and last had been fired, he was unpleasantly certain that he had counted only seven shots for the stranger. He cautiously exposed part of his sun helmet held in his hand and had it perforated. What gun are you using? He asked with cool politeness. Colts, came the answer. Francis stepped boldly into the open, saying, Then you're all out. I counted them. Eight. Now we can talk. The stranger stepped out, and Francis could not help admiring the fine figure of him, despite the fact that a dirty pair of canvas pants, a cotton undershirt, and a floppy sombrero constituted his garmenting. Further, it seemed he had previously known him, though it did not enter his mind that he was looking at a replica of himself. Talk? The stranger sneered, throwing down his pistol and drawing a knife. Now we'll just cut off your ears and maybe scalp you. Gee, you are sweet-natured and gentle animals in this neck of the woods, Francis retorted, his anger and disgust increasing. He drew his own hunting knife, brand new from the shop and shining. Say, let's wrestle and cut out this ten, twenty, and thirty knife stuff. I want your ears, the stranger answered pleasantly as he slowly advanced. Sure. First down and the man who wins the fall gets the other fellow's ears. Agreed. The young man in the canvas trousers sheathed his knife. Too bad there isn't a moving picture camera to film this. Francis girded, sheathing his own knife. I'm sore as a boil. I feel like a heap bed engine. Watch out, I'm coming in a rush, any way and every way for the first fall. Action and word went together, and his glorious rush ended ignominiously, for the stronger, apparently braced for the shock, yielded the instant their bodies met and fell over on his back, at the same time planting his foot in Francis's abdomen and, from the back purchase on the ground, transforming Francis's rush into a wild forward somersault. The fall on the sand knocked most of Francis's breath out of him, and the flying body of his foe, impacting on him, managed to do for what little breath was left him. As he lay speechless on his back, he observed the man on top of him gazing down at him with sudden curiosity. What do you want to wear a mustache for? The stranger muttered. Go on and cut him off. Francis gasped with the first of his returning breath. The ears are yours, but the mustache is mine. It is not in the bond. Besides, that fall was straight jujitsu. You said any way and every way for the first fall. The other quoted laughingly. As for your ears, keep them. I never intended to cut them off. And now that I look at them closely, the less I want them. Get up and get out of here. I've licked you. Vamos, and don't come sneaking around here again. Get scut! In greater disgust than ever, to which was added the humiliation of defeat, Francis turned down the beach toward his canoe. Say, little stranger, do you mind leaving your card? The victor called out after him. 
Visiting cards and cutthroating don't go together. Francis shot back across his shoulder as he squatted in the canoe and dipped his paddle. My name's Morgan. Surprise and startlement were the stranger's portion as he opened his mouth to speak, then changed his mind and murmured to himself, Same stock. No wonder we look alike. Still in the throes of disgust, Francis regained the shore of the bull, sat down on the edge of the dugout, filled and lighted his pipe, and gloomily meditated. Crazy, everybody, was the run of his thought. Nobody acts with reason. I'd like to see old Regan try to do business with these people. They'd get his ears. Could he have seen at that moment the young man of the canvas pants and of familiar appearance, he would have been certain that naught but lunacy resided in Latin America. For the young man in question, inside a grass-thatched hut in the heart of his island, grinning to himself as he uttered aloud, I guess I put the fear of God into that particular member of the Morgan family, had just begun to stare at a photographic reproduction of an oil painting on the wall of the original Sir Henry Morgan. Well, old pirate, he continued grinning, Two of your latest descendants came pretty close to getting each other with automatics that would make your antediluvian horse pistols look like 30 cents. He bent to a battered and worm-eaten sea chest, lifted the lid that was monogrammed with an M, and again addressed the portrait. Well, old pirate Welshman of an ancestor, all you've left me is the old duds and a face that looks like yours. And I guess if I was really fired up, I could play your Port-au-Prince stunt about as well as you played it yourself. A moment later, beginning to dress himself in the age-worn and moth-eaten garments of the chest, he added, Well, here's the old duds on my back. Come, Mr. Ancestor, down out of your frame, and dare to tell me a point of looks in which we differ. Clad in Sir Henry Morgan's ancient habiliments, a cutlass strapped on around the middle, and two flintlock pistols of huge and ponderous design thrust into his waist scarf, the resemblance between the living man and the pictured semblance of the old buccaneer, who had long since resolved to dust, was striking. Back to back against the mainmast, held at bay the entire crew. As the young man, picking the strings of a guitar, began to sing the old buccaneer rouse, it seemed to him that the picture of his forebear faded into another picture, and that he saw the old forebear himself back to a mainmast, cutlass out and flashing, facing a semicircle of fantastically clad sailor cutthroats, while behind him, on the opposite side of the mast, another similarly garbed and accoutred man, with cutlass flashing, faced the other semicircle of cutthroats that completed the ring about the mast. The vivid vision of his fancy was broken by the breaking of a guitar string, which he had thrummed to passionately, and in the sharp pause of silence it seemed that a fresh vision of old Sir Henry came to him, down out of the frame, and beside him, real in all seeming, plucking at his sleeve to lead him out of the hut and whispering a ghostly repetition of, Back to back against the main must held at bay the entire crew. The young man obeyed his shadowy guide, or some prompting of his own profound of intuition, and went out the door and down to the beach, where, gazing across the narrow channel, on the beach of the bull, he saw his late antagonist backed up against the great boulder of coral rock, standing off an attack of sack-clouded, machete-wielding Indians with wide, sweeping strokes of a driftwood timber. And Francis, in extremity, swaying dizzily from the blow of a rock on his head, saw the apparition that almost convinced him he was already dead and in the realm of the shades, of Sir Henry Morgan himself, cutlass in hand, rushing up the beach to his rescue. Further, the apparition, brandishing the cutlass and laying out Indians right and left, was bellowing, Back to back against the mainmast held at a the entire crew.
As Francis's knees gave under him, and he slowly crumpled and sank down, he saw the Indians scatter and flee before the onslaught of the weird pirate figure, and heard their cries of, Heaven help us! The Virgin protect us! It's the ghost of old Morgan! Francis next opened his eyes inside the grass hut in the midmost center of the calf. First, in the glimmering of sight of returning consciousness, he beheld the pictured lineaments of Sir Henry Morgan staring down at him from the wall. Next, it was a younger edition of the same, in three dimensions of living, moving flesh, who thrust a mug of brandy to his lips and bade him drink. Francis was on his feet ere he touched lips to the mug, and both he and the stranger man, moved by a common impulse, looked squarely into each other's eyes, glanced at the picture on the wall, and touched mugs in a salute to the picture and to each other ere they drank. "'You told me you were a Morgan,' the stranger said. "'I am a Morgan. That man on the wall fathered my breed. Your breed?' "'The old buccaneers.' Francis returned. "'My first name is Francis. And yours?' "'Henry, straight from the original. We must be remote cousins or something or other. I'm after the foxy old niggerly old Welshman's loot.' "'So am I,' said Francis, extending his hand. "'But to hell with sharing.' "'The old blood talks in you.' Henry smiled approbation. "'For him to have who finds.' I've turned most of this island upside down in the last six months, and all I've found are these old duds. I'm with you to beat you if I can, but to put my back against the mainmast with you any time the needed call goes out. That song's a wonder, Francis urged. I want to learn it. Lift the stave again. And together, clanking their mugs, they sang... Back to back, back against, against the mainmast, mainmast held it bay the entire, entire crew. crew. End of chapter 2。Chapter 3 of Hearts of Three by Jack London。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。But a splitting headache put a stop to Francis's singing and made him glad to be swung in a cool hammock by Henry, who rode off to the Angelique with orders from his visitor to the skipper to stay at anchor but not to permit any of his sailors to land on the calf not until late in the morning of the following day after hours of heavy sleep did francis get on his feet and announce that his head was clear again i know what it is got bucked off a horse once his strange relative sympathized as he poured him a huge cup of fragrant black coffee drink that down it will make a new man of you can't offer you much for breakfast except bacon, sea biscuit, and some scrambled turtle eggs. They're fresh, I guarantee that, for I dug them out this morning while you slept. That coffee is a meal in itself, Francis praised, meanwhile studying his kinsmen and ever and anon glancing at the portrait of their relative. You're just like him, and in more than mere looks. Henry laughed, catching him in his scrutiny. When you refused to share yesterday, it was old Sir Henry to the life. He had a deep-seated antipathy against sharing even with his own crews. It's what's caused most of his troubles, and he certainly never shared a penny of his treasure with any of his descendants. Now I'm different. Not only will I share the calf with you, but I'll present you with my half as well, lock, stock, and barrel. This grass hut, all these nice furnishings, tenements, hereditaments, and everything, and what's left of the turtle eggs. When do you want to move in? You mean... Francis asked. Just that. There's nothing here. I've just about dug the island upside down, and all I found was the chest there, full of old clothes. It must have encouraged you. Mightily. I thought I had a hammerlock on it. At any rate, it showed I'm on the right track. What's the matter with trying the bull? Francis queried. That's my idea right now. Was the answer though I've got another clue for over the mainland. Those old-timers had a way of noting down their latitude and longitude whole degrees out of the way. 
10 north and 90 east on the chart might mean 12 north and 92 east. Francis concurred. Then again, it might mean 8 north and 88 east. They carried the correction in their heads, and if they died unexpectedly, which was their custom, it seems, the secret died with them. I've half a notion to go over to the bowl and chase those turtle catchers back to the mainland. Henry went on. And then again, I'd almost like to tackle the mainland clue first. I suppose you've got a stock of clues, too? Sure thing. Francis nodded. But say, I'd like to take back what I said about not sharing. Say the word. The other encouraged. Then I do say it. Their hands extended and gripped in ratification. Morgan and Morgan strictly limited, chortled Francis. Assets, the whole Caribbean Sea, the Spanish Main, most of Central America, one chest full of perfectly no-good old clothes, and a lot of holes in the ground. Henry joined in the other's humor. Liabilities, snakebite, leaving Indians, malaria, yellow fever. And pretty girls with a habit of kissing total strangers one moment, and of sticking up said total strangers with shiny silver revolvers the next moment. Francis cut in. Let me tell you about it. Day before yesterday, I rowed ashore over on the mainland. The moment I landed, the prettiest girl in the world pounced out upon me and dragged me away into the jungle. Thought she was going to eat me or marry me. I didn't know which. And before I could find out, what's the pretty damsel do but pass uncomplimentary remarks on my mustache and chase me back to the boat with a revolver? Told me to beat it and never come back, or words to that effect. Whereabouts on the mainland was this? Henry demanded with a penseness which Francis, chuckling his reminiscence of the misadventure, did not notice. Down toward the other end of Shariki Lagoon, he replied. It was the stamping ground of the Solano family, I learned, and they are a red, peppery family, as I found out. But I haven't told you all. Listen, first she dragged me into the vegetation and insulted my mustache. Next, she chased me to the boat with a drawn revolver, and then she wanted to know why I didn't kiss her. Can you beat that? And did you? Henry demanded, his hand unconsciously clinching by his side. What could a poor stranger in a strange land do? It was some armful of pretty girl— The next fraction of a second, Francis had sprung to his feet and blocked before his jaw a crushing blow of Henry's fist. I, I beg your pardon. Henry mumbled and slumped down on the ancient sea chest. I'm a fool, I know, but I'll be hanged if I can stand for— There you go again, Francis interrupted resentfully. As crazy as everybody else in this crazy country, one moment you bandage up my cracked head, and the next moment you want to knock that same head clean off of me, as bad as the girl taking turns at kissing me and shoving a gun into my midriff. That's right. Fire away. I deserve it. Henry admitted ruefully, but involuntarily began to fire up, as he continued with, Confound you, that was Leoncia. What if it was Leoncia? Or Mercedes? Or Dolores? Can't a fellow kiss a pretty girl at a revolver's point without having his head knocked off by the next ruffian he meets in dirty canvas pants on a notorious sand heap of an island? When the pretty girl is engaged to marry the ruffian in the dirty canvas pants. You don't mean to tell me. The other broke in excitedly. It isn't particularly amusing to said ruffian to be told that his sweetheart has been kissing a ruffian she never saw before from off a disreputable Jamaican nigger schooner. Henry completed his sentence. And she took me for you. Francis mused, glimpsing the situation. I don't blame you for losing your temper, though you must admit it's a nasty one. Wanted to cut off my ears yesterday, didn't you? Yours is just as nasty, Francis, my boy. The way you insisted that I cut them off when I had you down. <laughs> Both young men laughed in hearty amity. <laughs> <laughs> it's the old Morgan temper. Henry said. He was by all the accounts a peppery old cuss. No more peppery than those Solanos you're marrying into. Why, most of the family came down on the beach and peppered me with rifles on my departing way. 
and your Leonthea pulled her little pop-gun on a long-bearded old fellow who might have been her father, and gave him to understand she'd shoot him full of holes if he didn't stop plugging away at me. It was her father, I'll wager, old Enrico himself. Henry exclaimed. And the other chaps were her brothers. Lovely lizards, ejaculated Francis. Say, don't you think life is liable to become a trifle monotonous when you're married into such a peaceful, dove-like family as that? He broke off, struck by a new idea. By the way, Henry, since they all thought it was you and not I, why in thunderation did they want to kill you? Some more of your crusty Morgan temper that peeved your prospective wife's relatives? Henry looked at him a moment, as if debating with himself, and then answered, I don't mind telling you it is a nasty mess, and I suppose my temper was to blame. I quarreled with her uncle. He was her father's youngest brother. Was? Interrupted Francis, with significant stress on the past tense. Was, I said. Henry nodded. He isn't now. His name was Alfaro Solano, and he had some temper himself. They claim to be descended from the Spanish conquistadors, and they're prouder than hornets. He'd made money in logwood, and he had just got a big Hennequin plantation started farther down the coast. And then we quarreled. It was in the little town over there, San Antonio. It may have been a misunderstanding, though I still maintain he was wrong. He always was looking for trouble with me. Didn't want me to marry Leoncia, you see. Well, it was a hot time. It started in a pulcaria where Alfaro had been drinking more mescal than was good for him. He insulted me all right. They had to hold us apart and take our guns away, and we separated swearing death and destruction. That was the trouble. Our quarrel and our threats were heard by a score of witnesses. Within two hours, the commissario himself and two gendarmes found me bending over Alfaro's body in a back street in the town. He'd been knifed in the back, and I'd stumbled over him on the way to the beach. Explain? No such thing. There were the quarrel and the threats of vengeance, and there I was, not two hours afterward, caught dead to right with his warm corpse. I haven't been back in San Antonio since, and I didn't waste any time in getting away. Alfaro was very popular. You know, the dashing type that catches the rabble's fancy. Why they couldn't have been persuaded to give me even the semblance of a trial. Wanted my blood there and then, and I departed very pronto. Next up, at Bocas del Toro, a messenger from Leoncia delivered back the engagement ring. And there you are. I developed a real big disgust, and since I didn't dare go back with all the Solanos and the rest of the population thirsting for my life, I came over here to play hermit for a while and dig for Morgan's treasure. Just the same, I wonder who did stick that knife into Alfaro. If I ever find him... Then I clear myself with Leoncia and the rest of the Solanos, and there isn't a doubt in the world that there'll be a wedding. And now that it's all over, I don't mind admitting that Alfaro was a good scout, even if his temper did go off at half-cock. Clear as print, Francis murmured. No wonder her father and brothers wanted to perforate me. Why, the more I look at you, the more I see we're as like as two peas, except for my mustache. And for this... Henry rolled up his sleeve, and on the left forearm showed a long, thin, white scar. Got that when I was a boy. Fell off a windmill and through the glass roof of a hothouse. Now listen to me, Francis said, his face beginning to light with the project forming in his mind. Somebody's got to straighten you out of this mess, and the chap's name is Francis, partner in the firm of Morgan and Morgan. You stick around here or go over and begin prospecting on the bull while I go back and explain things to Leoncia and her people. If only they don't shoot you first before you can explain you are not I. Henry muttered bitterly. That's the trouble with those Solanos. They shoot first and talk afterward. They won't listen to reason unless it's post-mortem. Guess I'll take a chance, old man. Francis assured the other himself all afire with the plan of clearing up the distressing situation between Henry and the girl. But the thought of her perplexed him. He experienced more than a twinge of regret that the lovely creature belonged of right to the man who looked so much like him, and he saw again the vision of her on the beach, 
when with conflicting emotions she had alternately loved him and yearned toward him and blazed her scorn and contempt on him he sighed involuntarily <sighs> what's that for henry demanded quizzically leontia is an exceedingly pretty girl francis answered with transparent frankness just the same she's yours and i'm going to make it my business to see that you get her where's that ring she returned if i don't put it on her finger for you and be back here in a week with the good news you can cut off my mustache along with my ears an hour later captain trefethen having sent a boat to the beach from the angelique in response to the signal the two young men were saying good-bye just two things more francis first and I forgot to tell you, Leontia is not a Solano at all, though she thinks she is. Alfaro told me himself. She is an adopted child, and old Enrico fairly worships her, though neither his blood nor his race runs in her veins. Alfaro never told me the ins and outs of it, though he did say she wasn't Spanish at all. I don't even know whether she's English or American. She talks good enough English, though she got that at convent. You see, she was adopted when she was a wee thing, and she's never known anything else than that Enrico is her father. And no wonder she scorned and hated me for you, Francis laughed, believing, as she did, as she still does, that you knifed her full-blood uncle in the back. Henry nodded and went on. The other thing is fairly important, and that's the law, or the absence of it, rather. They make it whatever they want it, down in this out-of-the-way hole. It's a long way to Panama, and the gubernator of this state or district or whatever they call it is a sleepy old Salinas. The jefe politico at San Antonio is the man to keep an eye on. He's the little czar of that neck of the woods, and he's some crooked hombre, take it from yours truly. Graft is too weak a word to apply to some of his deals, and he's as cruel and bloodthirsty as a weasel. And his one crowning delight is an execution. He dotes on a hanging. Keep your weather eye on him, whatever you do. And, well, so long. And half of whatever I find on the bull is yours. And see you get that ring back on Leoncia's finger. Two days later, after the half-breed skipper had reconnoitered ashore and brought back the news that all the men of Leoncia's family were away, Francis had himself landed on the beach where he had first met her. No maidens with silver revolvers, nor men with rifles, were manifest. All was placid, and the only person on the beach was a ragged little Indian boy who at sight of a coin readily consented to carry a note up to the young senorita of the big hacienda. As Francis scrawled on a sheet of paper from his notebook, I am the man whom you mistook for Henry Morgan, and I have a message for you from him. He little dreamed that untoward happenings were about to occur with as equal rapidity and frequence as on his first visit. For that matter, could he have peeped over the outjut of rock against which he leaned his back while composing the note to Leoncia, he would have been startled by a vision of the young lady herself, emerging like a sea goddess fresh from a swim in the sea. But he wrote calmly on, the Indian lad even more absorbed than himself in the operation, so that it was Leoncia coming around the rock from behind who first caught sight of him. Stifling an exclamation, she turned and fled blindly into the green screen of jungle. His first warning of her proximity was immediately thereafter, when a startled scream of fear aroused him. Note and pencil fell to the sand as he sprang toward the direction of the cry and collided with a wet and scantily dressed young woman who was recoiling backward from whatever had caused her scream. The unexpectedness of the collision was provocative of a second startled scream from her ere she could turn and recognize that it was not a new attack but a rescuer. She darted past him, her face colorless from the fright, stumbled over the Indian boy, nor paused until she was out on the open sand. What is it? Francis demanded. Are you hurt? What's happened? 
she pointed at her bare knee where two tiny drops of blood oozed forth side by side from the scarcely perceptible lacerations it was a viperine she said a deadly viperine i shall be a dead woman in five minutes and i am glad glad for then my heart will be tormented no more by you she leveled an accusing finger at him gasped the beginning of denunciation she could not utter and sank down in a faint francis knew about the snakes of central america merely by hearsay but the hearsay was terrible enough men talked of even mules and dogs dying in horrible agony five to ten minutes after being struck by tiny reptiles fifteen to twenty inches long small wonder she had fainted was his thought with so terribly rapid a poison doubtlessly beginning to work his knowledge of the treatment of snake-bite was likewise hearsay but flashed through his mind the recollection of the need of a tourniquet to shut off the circulation above the wound and prevent the poison from reaching the heart he pulled out his handkerchief and tied it loosely around her leg above the knee thrust in a short piece of driftwood stick and twisted the handkerchief to savage tightness next and all by hearsay working swiftly he opened the small blade of his pocket knife burned it with several matches to make sure against germs and cut carefully but remorsefully into the two lacerations made by the snake's fangs he was in a fright himself working with feverish deftness and apprehending at any moment that the pangs of dissolution would begin to set in on the beautiful form before him from all he had heard the bodies of snake victims began to swell quickly and prodigiously even as he finished exoriating the fang wounds his mind was made up to his next two acts first he would suck out all poison he possibly could and next light a cigarette and with its live end proceed to cauterize the flesh but while he was still making light criss-cross cuts with the point of his knife blade she began to move restlessly lie down he commanded as she sat up and just when he was bending his lips to the task in response he received a resounding slap alongside of his face from her little hand at the same instant the indian lad danced out of the jungle swinging a small dead snake by the tail and crying exultingly lombari lombari at which francis assumed the worst lie down and be quiet he repeated harshly you haven't a second to lose but she had eyes only for the dead snake her relief was patent but francis was no witness to it for he was bending again to perform the classic treatment of snake bite you dare she threatened him it's only a baby labari and its bite is harmless i thought it was a viperine they look alike when the labari is small the constriction of the circulation by the tourniquet pained her and she glanced down and discovered his handkerchief knotted about her leg oh what have you done a warm blush began to suffuse her face but it was only a baby labari she reproached him you told me it was a viperine he retorted she hid her face in her hands although the pink of flesh burned furiously in her ears yet he could have sworn unless it were hysteria that she was laughing and he knew for the first time how really hard was the task he had undertaken to put the ring of another man on her finger so he deliberately hardened his heart against the beauty and fascination of her and said bitterly and now i suppose some of your gentry will shoot me full of hulls because i don't know a labari from a viperine you might call some of the farm hands down to do it or maybe you'd like to take a shot at me yourself but she seemed not to have heard for she had arisen with the quick lightness to be expected of so gloriously fashioned a creature and was stamping on her foot on the sand it's asleep my foot she explained with laughter unhidden this time by her hands you're acting perfectly disgracefully he assured her wickedly 
when you consider that I am the murderer of your uncle. Thus reminded, the laughter ceased, and the color receded from her face. She made no reply, but bending with fingers that trembled with anger, she strove to unknot the handkerchief as if it were some loathsome thing. Better let me help, he suggested pleasantly. You beast, she flamed at him. Step aside. Your shadow falls upon me. Now you are delicious, charming, he girded, belying the desire that stirred compellingly within him to clasp her in his arms. You quite revive my last recollection of you here on the beach, one second reproaching me for not kissing you, the next second kissing me. Yes, you did, too. And the third second threatening to destroy my digestion forever with that little tin toy pistol of yours. No, you haven't changed an iota from last time. You're the same spitfire of a Leoncia. You'd better let me untie that for you. Don't you see the knot is jammed? Your little fingers can never manage it. She stamped her foot in sheer inarticulateness of rage. Lucky for me you don't make a practice of taking your tin toy pistol in the swimming with you. He teased on. Or else there'd be a funeral right here on the beach, pretty pronto of a perfectly nice young man whose intentions are never less than the best. The Indian boy returned at this moment, running with her bathing wrap, which she snatched from him and put on hastily. Next, with the boy's help, she attacked the knot again. When the handkerchief came off, she flung it from her, as if, in truth, it were a viperine. It was contamination, she flashed for his benefit. But Francis, still engaged in hardening his heart against her, shook his head slowly and said, It doesn't save you, Leoncia. I've left my mark on you that will never come off. He pointed to the exhortations he had made on her knee and laughed. The mark of the beast. She came back, turning to go. I warn you to take yourself off, Mr. Henry Morgan. But he stepped in her way. And now we'll talk business, Miss Solano, he said in changed tones. And you will listen. Let your eyes flash all they please, but don't interrupt me. He stooped and picked up the note he had been engaged in writing. I was just sending that to you by the boy when you screamed. Take it. Read it. It won't bite you. It isn't a viperine. Though she refused to receive it, her eyes involuntarily scanned the opening line. I am the man whom you mistook for Henry Morgan. She looked at him with startled eyes that could not comprehend much, but which were guessing many vague things. On my honor, he said gravely. You are not Henry? She gasped. No, I am not. Won't you please take it and read? This time she complied, while he gazed with all his eyes upon the golden pallor of the sun on her tropic-touched blonde face, which colored the blood beneath, or which was touched by the blood beneath, to the amazingly beautiful golden pallor. Almost in a dream he discovered himself looking into her startled, questioning eyes of velvet brown. And who should have signed this? She repeated. He came to himself and bowed. But the name, your name. Morgan, Francis Morgan. As I explained there, Henry and I are some sort of distant relatives, 45th cousins or something like that. To his bewilderment, a great doubt suddenly dawned in her eyes, and the old familiar anger flashed. Henry, she accused him. This is a ruse, a devil's trick you're trying to play on me. Of course you are, Henry. Francis pointed to his mustache. You've grown that since, she challenged. He pulled up his sleeve and showed her his left arm from wrist to elbow, but she only looked her incomprehension of the meaning of his action. Do you remember the scar? He asked. She nodded. Then find it. She bent her head in swift, vain search then shook it slowly as she faltered. I, 
I ask your forgiveness. I was terribly mistaken, and when I think of the way I, I've treated you... That kiss was delightful. He naughtily disclaimed. She recollected more immediate passages, glanced down at her knee, and stifled what he adjudged was a most adorable giggle. You say you have a message from Henry. She changed the subject abruptly. And that he is innocent? This is true? Oh, I do want to believe you. I am morally certain that Henry no more killed your uncle than did I. Then say no more. At least not now. She interrupted joyfully. First of all, I must make amends to you, though you must confess that some of the things you have done and said were abominable. You had no right to kiss me. If you will remember... He contended. I did it at the pistol point. How was I to know but what I would get shot if I didn't? Oh, hush, hush, she begged. You must go with me now to the house, and you can tell me about Henry on the way. Her eyes chanced upon the handkerchief she had flung so contemptuously aside. She ran to it and picked it up. Poor ill-treated kerchief, she crooned to it. To you also I must make amends. I shall myself launder you and... Her eyes lifted to Francis as she addressed him. And return it to you, sir, fresh and sweet and all wrapped around my heart of gratitude. And the mark of the beast? He queried. I am so sorry. She confessed penitently. And may I be permitted to rest my shadow upon you? Do, do! She cried gaily. There, I am in your shadow now, and we must start. Francis tossed a peso to the grinning Indian boy, and, in high elation, turned and followed her into the tropic growth on the path that led up to the white hacienda. Seated on the broad piazza of the Solano hacienda, Alvarez Torres saw through the tropic shrubs the couple approaching along the winding driveway, and he saw what made him grit his teeth and draw very erroneous conclusions. He muttered imprecations to himself and forgot his cigarette. What he saw was Leoncia and Francis in such deep and excited talk as to be oblivious of everything else. He saw Francis grow so urgent of speech and gesture as to cause Leoncia to stop abruptly and listen further to his pleading. Next, and Torres could scarcely believe the evidence of his eyes, he saw Francis produce a ring, and Leoncia, with averted face, extend her left hand and receive the ring upon her third finger. Engagement finger it was, and Torres could have sworn to it. What had really occurred was the placing of Henry's engagement ring back on Leoncia's hand, and Leoncia, she knew not why, had been vaguely averse to receiving it. Torres tossed the dead cigarette away, twisted his mustache fiercely, as if to relieve his own excitement, and advanced to meet them across the piazza. He did not return the girl's greeting at the first. Instead, with the wrathful face of the Latin, he burst out at Francis, One does not expect shame in a murderer, but at least one does expect simple decency. Francis smiled whimsically. There it goes again, he said. Another lunatic in this lunatic land. The last time, Leoncia, that I saw this gentleman was in New York. He was really anxious to do business with me. Now I meet him here, and the first thing he tells me is that I am an indecent, shameless murderer. Senor Torres, you must apologize, she declared angrily. The house of Solano is not accustomed to having its guests insulted. The house of Solano, I then understand, is accustomed to having its men murdered by transient adventurers. He retorted. No sacrifice is too great when it is in the name of hospitality. Get off your foot, Signor Torres, Francis advised him pleasantly. You are standing on it. I know what your mistake is. You think I am Henry Morgan. I am Francis Morgan, and you and I, not long ago, transacted business together in Regan's office in New York. There's my hand. 
Your shaking of it will be sufficient apology under the circumstances. Torres, overwhelmed for the moment by his mistake, took the extended hand and uttered apologies both to Francis and Leoncia. And now. <laughs> she beamed through laughter, clapping her hands to call a house servant. I must locate Mr. Morgan and go and get some clothes on. And after that, Senor Torres, if you will pardon us, we will tell you about Henry. While she departed, and while Francis followed away to his room on the heels of a young and pretty mestiza woman, Torres, his brain resuming its functions, found he was more angry than ever. This, then, was a newcomer and stranger to Leoncia, whom he had seen putting a ring on her engagement finger. He thought quickly and passionately for a moment. Leoncia, whom to himself he always named the queen of his dreams, had on an instant's notice engaged herself to a strange gringo from New York. It was unbelievable, monstrous. He clapped his hands, summoned his hired carriage from San Antonio, and was speeding down the drive when Francis strolled forth to have a talk with him about further details of the hiding place of old Morgan's treasure. After lunch, when a land breeze sprang up, which meant fair wind and a quick run across Chiriqui Lagoon and along the length of it to the bull and the calf, Francis, eager to bring to Henry the good word that his ring adorned Leoncia's finger, resolutely declined her proffered hospitality to remain for the night and meet Enrico Solano and his tall sons. Francis had a further reason for hasty departure. He could not endure the presence of Leoncia, and this in no sense uncomplimentary to her. She charmed him, drew him, to such extent that he dared not endure her charm and draw if he were to remain man faithful to the man in the canvas pants even then digging holes in the sands of the bull so francis departed a letter to henry from leoncia in his pocket the last moment ere he departed was abrupt with a sigh so quickly suppressed that leoncia wondered whether or not she had imagined it he tore himself away she gazed after his retreating form down the driveway until it was out of sight, then stared at the ring on her finger with a vaguely troubled expression. From the beach, Francis signaled the Angelique, riding at anchor, to send a boat ashore for him, but before it had been swung into the water, half a dozen horsemen, revolver belted, rifles across their pommels, rode down the beach upon him at a gallop. Two men led. The following four were hangdog half-castes. Of the two leaders, Francis recognized Torres. Every rifle came to rest on Francis, and he could not but obey the order snarled at him by the unknown leader to throw up his hands. And Francis opined aloud, To think of it, once, only the other day, or was it a million years ago? I thought auction bridge at a dollar a point was some excitement. Now, sirs, you on your horses, with your weapons threatening the violent introduction of foreign substances into my poor body, tell me what is doing now. Don't I ever get off this beach without gunpowder complications? Is it my ears or merely my mustache you want? We want you, answered the stranger leader, whose mustache bristled as magnetically as his crooked black eyes. And in the name of original sin and of all lovely lizards, who might you be? He is the Honorable Senor Mariano Vergara y Hijos, Jefe Político of San Antonio. Torres replied. Good night. Francis laughed, remembering the man's description as given to him by Henry. I suppose you think I've broken some harbor rule or sanitary regulation by anchoring here. But you must settle such things with my captain, Captain Trefethen, a very estimable gentleman. I am only the charterer of the schooner, just a passenger. You will find Captain Trefethen right up in maritime law and custom. You are wanted for the murder of Alfaro Solano, was Torres's answer. You didn't fool me, Henry Morgan, with your talk up at the hacienda that you are someone else. I know that someone else. His name is Francis Morgan. 
and I do not hesitate to add that he is not a murderer, but a gentleman. Ye gods and little fishes, Francis exclaimed. And yet you shook hands with me, Signor Torres. I was fooled, Torres admitted sadly. But only for a moment. Will you come peaceably? As if... Francis shrugged his shoulders eloquently at the six rifles. I suppose you'll give me a pronto trial and hang me at daybreak. Justice is swift in Panama, the jefe politico replied, his English queerly accented but understandable. But not so quick as that. We will not hang you at daybreak. Ten o'clock in the morning is more comfortable all around, don't you think? Oh, by all means, Francis retorted. Make it eleven or twelve noon. I won't mind. You will kindly come with us, senor. Mariano Vercara e hijos said, the suavity of his diction not masking the iron of its intention. Juan Ignacio, he ordered in Spanish. Dismount. Take his weapons. No, it will not be necessary to tie his hands. Put him on the horse behind Gregorio. Francis, in a venerably whitewashed adobe cell, with walls five feet thick, its earth floor carpeted with the forms of half a dozen sleeping peon prisoners, listened to a dim hammering not very distant, remembered the trial from which he had just emerged, and whistled long and low. The hour was half-past eight in the evening. The trial had begun at eight. The hammering was the hammering together of the scaffold beams from which place of eminence he was scheduled at ten next morning to swing off into space, supported from the ground by a rope around his neck. The trial had lasted half an hour by his watch. Twenty minutes would have covered it had Leoncia not burst in and prolonged it by the ten minutes courteously accorded her as the great lady of the Solano family. The jefe was right. Francis acknowledged to himself in a matter of soliloquy. Panama justice does move swiftly. The very possession of the letter given him by Leoncia and addressed to Henry Morgan had damned him. The rest had been easy. Half a dozen witnesses had testified to the murder and identified him as the murderer. The jefe politico himself had so testified. The one cheerful note had been the eruption on the scene of Leoncia, chaperoned by a palsied old aunt of the Solano family. That had been sweet, the fight the beautiful girl had put up for his life, despite the fact that it was foredoomed to futility. When she had made Francis roll up the sleeve and expose his left forearm, he had seen the jefe politico shrug his shoulders contemptuously, and he had seen Leoncia fling a passion of Spanish words, too quick for him to follow, at Torres. And he had seen and heard the gesticulation and the roar of the mob-filled courtroom as Torres had taken the stand. But what he had not seen was the whispered colloquy between Torres and the jefe, as the former was in the thick of forcing his way through the press to the witness box. He no more saw this particular side play than did he know that Torres was in the pay of Regan to keep him away from New York as long as possible, and as long as ever, if possible. Nor then did he know that Torres himself, in love with Leoncia, was consumed with a jealousy that knew no limit to its ire. All of which had blinded Francis to the play under the interrogation of Torres by Leoncia which had compelled Torres to acknowledge that he had never seen a scar on Francis Morgan's left forearm. While Leoncia had looked at the little old judge in triumph, the jefe politico had advanced and demanded of Torres in stentorian tones, Can you swear that you ever saw a scar on Henry Morgan's arm? Torres had been baffled and embarrassed, had looked bewilderment to the judge and pleadingness to Leoncia, and in the end, without speech, shaken his head that he could not so swear. The roar of triumph had gone up from the crowd of ragamuffins. The judge had pronounced sentence. 
the roar had doubled on itself and francis had been hustled out into his cell not entirely unresistingly by the gendarmes and the commissario all apparently solicitous of saving him from the mob that was unwilling to wait till ten next morning for his death that poor dub torres who fell down on the scar on henry francis was meditating sympathetically when the bolts of his cell door shot back and he arose to greet leoncia but she declined to greet him for the moment as she flared at the commissario in rapid-fire spanish with gestures of command to which he yielded when he ordered the jailer to remove the peons to other cells and himself with a nervous and apologetic bowing went out and closed the door and then leoncia broke down sobbing on his shoulder in his arms it is a cursed country a cursed country there is no fair play and as francis held her pliant form meltingly exquisite in its maddeningness of woman he remembered henry in his canvas pants barefooted under his floppy sombrero digging holes in the sand of the bull he tried to draw away from the armful of deliciousness and only half succeeded still at such slight removal of distance he essayed the intellectual part rather than the emotional part he desired all too strongly to act and now i know at last what a frame-up is he assured her farthest from the promptings of his heart if these latins of your country thought more coolly instead of acting so passionately they might be building railroads and developing their country that trial was a straight passionate frame-up they just knew i was guilty and were so eager to punish me that they wouldn't even bother for mere evidence or establishment of identity why delay they knew henry morgan had knifed alfaro they knew i was henry morgan when one knows why bother to find out deaf to his words sobbing and struggling to cling closer while he spoke the moment he had finished she was deep again in his arms against him to him her lips raised to his and ere he was aware his own lips to hers i love you i love you she whispered brokenly no no he denied what he most desired henry and i are two alike it is henry you love and i am not henry she tore herself away from her own clinging drew henry's ring from her finger and threw it on the floor francis was so beyond himself that he knew not what was going to happen the next moment and was only saved from whatever it might be by the entrance of the commissario watch in hand with averted face striving to see naught else than the moments registered by the second hand on the dial she stiffened herself proudly and all but broke down again as francis slipped henry's ring back on her finger and kissed her hand in farewell just ere she passed out the door she turned and with a whispered movement of the lips that was devoid of sound told him i love you promptly as the stroke of the clock at ten o'clock francis was led out into the jail patio where stood the gallows all san antonio was joyously and shoutingly present including much of the neighboring population and leoncia enrico solano and his five tall sons enrico and his sons fumed and strutted but the jefe politico backed by the commissario and his gendarmes was adamant in vain as francis was forced to the foot of the scaffold did leoncia strive to get to him and did her men strive to persuade her to leave the patio in vain also did her father and brothers protest that francis was not the man the jefe politico smiled contemptuously and ordered the execution to proceed on top the scaffold standing on the trap francis declined the ministrations of the priest telling him in spanish that no innocent man being hanged needed intercessions with the next world but that the men who were doing the hanging were in need of just such intercessions they had tied francis's legs and were in the act of tying his arms with the men who held the noose and the black cap hovering near to put them on him when the voice of a singer was heard approaching from without 
and the song he sang was Back to back against the mainmast held at bay the entire crew. Leoncia, almost fainting, recovered at the sound of the voice, and cried out with sharp delight as she described Henry Morgan entering, thrusting aside the guards at the gate who tried to bar his way. At sight of him, the only one present who suffered chagrin was Torres, which passed unnoticed in the excitement. The populace was in accord with the jefe, who shrugged his shoulders and announced that one man was as good as another so long as the hanging went on. And here arose hot contention from the Solano men that Henry was likewise innocent of the murder of Alfaro but it was Francis, from the scaffold, while his arms and legs were being untied, who shouted through the tumult, You tried me. You have not tried him. You cannot hang a man without trial. He must have his trial. And when Francis had descended from the scaffold, and was shaking Henry's hand in both his own, the commissario, with the jefe at his back, duly arrested Henry Morgan for the murder of Alfaro Solano. End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of Hearts of Three by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. « We must work quickly. That is the one thing sure,' Francis said to the little conclave of Solanos on the piazza of the Solano Hacienda. « One thing sure,' Leoncia cried out scornfully ceasing from her anguished pacing up and down. The one thing sure is that we must save him. As she spoke, she shook a passionate finger under Francis's nose to emphasize her point. Not content, she shook her finger with equal emphasis under the noses of all and sundry of her father and brothers. Quick! she flamed on. Of course we must be quick. It is that or... Her voice trailed off into the unvoiceable horror of what would happen to Henry if they were not quick. All gringos look alike to the jefe. Frances nodded sympathetically. She was splendidly beautiful and wonderful, he thought. He certainly runs all San Antonio, and short shrift is his motto. He'll give Henry no more time than he gave us. We must get him out tonight. Now listen. Leoncia began again. We Solanos cannot permit this, this execution. Our pride, our honor, we cannot permit it. Speak, any of you. Father, you, suggest something. And while the discussion went on, Francis, for the time being, silent, wrestled deep in the throes of sadness. Leoncia's fervor was magnificent, but it was for another man, and it did not precisely exhilarate him. Strong upon him was the memory of the jail patio after he had been released and Henry had been arrested. He could still see, with the same stab at the heart, Leoncia in Henry's arms, Henry seeking her hand to ascertain if his ring was on it, and the long kiss of the embrace that followed. Ah, oh, well, he sighed to himself, he had done his best. After Henry had been led away, had he not told Leoncia, quite deliberately and coldly, that Henry was her man and lover, and the wisest of choices for the daughter of the Solanos. But the memory of it did not make him a bit happy, nor did the rightness of it. Right it was, that he never questioned, and it strengthened him into hardening his heart against her. Yet the right he found in his case to be the sorriest of consolation. And yet, what else could he expect? It was his misfortune to have arrived too late in Central America, that was all, and to find this flower of a woman already annexed by a previous comer, a man as good as himself, and, his heart of fairness prompted, even better. And his heart of fairness compelled loyalty to Henry from him, to Henry Morgan of the breed and blood, to Henry Morgan, the wildfire descendant of a wildfire ancestor in canvas pants and floppy sombrero, with a penchant for the ears of strange young men, 
living on sea biscuit and turtle eggs, and digging up the bull and the calf for old Sir Henry's treasure. And while Enrico Solano and his sons talked plans and projects on their broad piazza, to which Francis lent only half an ear, a house-servant came, whispered in Leoncia's ear, and led her away around the L of the piazza, where occurred a scene that would have excited Francis's risibilities and wrath. Around the L, Alvarez Torres, in all the medieval Spanish splendor of dress of a great haciendado owner, such as still obtains in Latin America, greeted her, bowed low with doff sombrero in hand, and seated her in a rattan settee. Her own greeting was sad, but shot through with curiousness, as if she hoped he brought some word of hope. The trial is over, Leoncia, he said softly, tenderly, as one speaks of the dead. He is sentenced tomorrow at ten o'clock is the time. It is all very sad, most very sad. But... He shrugged his shoulders. No, I shall not speak harshly of him. He was an honorable man. His one fault was his temper. It was too quick, too fiery. It led him into a mischance of honor. Never in a cool moment of reasonableness would he have stabbed Alfaro. He never killed my uncle, Leoncia cried, raising her averted face. And it is regrettable. Torres proceeded gently and sadly avoiding any disagreement. The judge, the people, the jefe politico, unfortunately all are united in believing that he did, which is most regrettable, but which is not what I came to see you about. I came to offer my service in any and all ways you may command. My life, my honor, are at your disposal. Speak. I am your slave. Dropping suddenly and gracefully on one knee before her, he caught her hand from her lap, and would have instantly flooded on with his speech had not his eyes lighted on the diamond ring on her engagement finger. He frowned, but concealed the frown with bent face until he could drive it from his features and begin to speak. I knew you when you were small, Leoncia, so very, very charmingly small. And I loved you always. No, listen, please. My heart must speak. Hear me out. I loved you always. But when you returned from your convent, from schooling abroad, a woman, a grand and noble lady fit to rule in the house of the Solanos, I was burnt by your beauty. I have been patient. I refrained from speaking. But you may have guessed. You surely must have guessed. I have been on fire for you ever since. I have been consumed by the flame of your beauty, by the flame of you that is deeper than your beauty. He was not to be stopped, as she well knew, and she listened patiently, gazing down on his bent head and wondering idly why his hair was so unbecomingly cut, and whether it had been last cut in New York or San Antonio. Do you know what you have been to me ever since your return? She did not reply, nor did she endeavor to withdraw her hand, although his was crushing and bruising her flesh against Henry Morgan's ring. She forgot to listen, led away by a chain of thought that linked far. Not in such rodomontade of speech had Henry Morgan loved and won her, was the beginning of the chain. Why did those of Spanish blood always voice their emotions so exaggeratedly? Henry had been so different. Scarcely had he spoken a word. He had acted. Under her glamour, himself glamouring her, without warning, so certain was he not to surprise and frighten her, he had put his arms around her and pressed his lips to hers. And hers had been neither too startled nor altogether unresponsive. Not until after that first kiss, arms still around her, had Henry begun to speak at all. And what plan was being broached around the corner of the L by her men and Francis Morgan? Her mind strayed on, deaf to the suitor at her feet. 
Francis. Ah! She almost sighed and marveled what of her self-known love for Henry, why this stranger gringo so enamored her heart. Was she a wanton? Was it one man, or another man, or any man? No, no, she was not fickle nor unfaithful. And yet, perhaps it was because Francis and Henry were so much alike, and her poor, stupid, loving woman's heart failed properly to distinguish between them. And yet, while it had seemed she would have followed Henry anywhere over the world, in any luck or fortune, it seemed to her now that she would follow Francis even farther. She did love Henry, her heart solemnly proclaimed, but also did she love Francis, and almost did she divine that Francis loved her. The fervor of his lips on hers in his prison cell was inerasable, and there was a difference in her love for the two men that confuted her powers of reason, and almost drove her to the shameful conclusion that she, the latest and only woman of the house of Solano, was a wanton. A severe pinch of her flesh against Henry's ring, caused by the impassioned grasp of Torres, brought her back to him, so that she could hear the spate of his speech pouring on. You have been the delicious thorn in my side, the spiked rower of the spur, forever prodding the sweetest and most pointed pangs of love into my breast. I have dreamed of you, and for you, and I have my own name for you, ever than one name I have had for you, the queen of my dreams. And you will marry me, my Leoncia. We will forget this mad gringo who is already dead. I shall be gentle, kind. I shall love you always, and never shall any vision of him arise between us. For myself, I shall not permit it. For you, I shall love you so that it will be impossible for the memory of him to arise between us and give you one moment heart hurt. Leoncia debated in a long pause that added fuel to Torres's hopes. She felt the need to temporize. If Henry were to be saved, and had not Torres offered his services, not lightly could she turn him away when a man's life might depend upon him. Speak! I am consuming! Torres urged in a choking voice. Hush! Hush! she said softly. How can I listen to love from a live man, when the man I loved is yet alive? Loved? The past tense of it startled her. Likewise it startled Torres, fanning his hopes to fairer flames. Almost was she his. She had said, loved. She no longer bore love for Henry. She had loved him, but no longer and she, a maid and a woman of delicacy and sensibility, could not, of course, give name to her love for him while the other man still lived. It was subtle of her. He prided himself on his own subtlety, and he flattered himself that he had interpreted her veiled thought aright. And, well, he resolved, he would see to it that the man who was to die at ten next morning should have neither reprieve nor rescue. The one thing clear, if he were to win Leoncia quickly, was that Henry Morgan should die quickly. We will speak of it no more. Now, he said with chivalric gentleness, as he gently pressed her hand, rose to his feet, and gazed down on her. She returned a soft pressure of thanks with her own hand, ere she released it, and stood up. Come, she said, we will join the others. They are planning now, or trying to find some plan, to save Henry Morgan. The conversation of the group ebbed away as they joined it, as if out of half suspicion of Torres. Have you hit upon anything yet? Leoncia asked. Old Enrico, straight and slender and graceful as any of his sons, despite his age, shook his head. I have a plan, if you will pardon me. Torres began, but ceased at a warning glance from Alessandro, the eldest son. 
on the walk below the piazza had appeared two scarecrows of beggar boys not more than ten years of age by their size they seemed much older when judged by the shrewdness of their eyes and faces each wore a single marvellous garment so that between them it could be said they shared a shirt and pants but such a shirt and such pants the latter man's eyes of ancient duck were buttoned around the lad's neck the waistband reefed with knotted twine so as not to slip down over his shoulders his arms were thrust through the holes where the side pockets had been the legs of the pants had been hacked off with a knife to suit his own diminutive length of limb the tails on the man's shirt on the other boy dragged on the ground vamos alessandro shouted fiercely at them to be gone but the boy in the pants gravely removed a stone which he had been carrying on top of his bare head exposing a letter which had been thus carried alessandro leaned over took the letter and with a glance at the inscription passed it to leoncia while the boys began whining for money francis smiling despite himself at the spectacle of them tossed them a few pieces of small silver whereupon the shirt and the pants toddled away down the path the letter was from henry and leoncia scanned it hurriedly it was not precisely in farewell for he wrote in the tenor of a man who never expected to die save by some inconceivable accident nevertheless on the chance of such inconceivable thing becoming possible henry did manage to say good-bye and to include a facetious recommendation to leoncia not to forget francis who was well worth remembering because he was so much like himself henry leoncia's first impulse was to show the letter to the others but the portion about francis withstrained her it's from henry she said tucking the note into her bosom there is nothing of importance he seems to have not the slightest doubt that he will escape somehow we shall see that he does francis declared positively with a grateful smile to him and with one of interrogation to torres leoncia said you were speaking of a plan senor torres torres smiled twisted his moustache and struck an attitude of importance there is one way the gringo anglo-saxon way and it is simple straight to the point that is just what it is straight to the point we will go and take henry out of jail in forthright brutal and direct gringo fashion it is the one thing they will not expect therefore it will succeed there are enough unhung rascals on the beach with which to storm the jail hire them pay them well but only partly in advance and the thing is accomplished leoncia nodded eager agreement old enrico's eyes flashed and his nostrils distended as if already sniffing gunpowder the young men were taking fire from his example and all looked to francis for his opinion or agreement he shook his head slowly and leoncia uttered a sharp cry of disappointment in him that way is hopeless he said why should all of you risk your necks in a madcap attempt like that doomed to failure from the start as he talked he strode across from leoncia's side to the railing in such a way as to be for a moment between torres and the other men and at the same time managed a warning look to enrico and his sons as for henry it looks as if we're all up with him you mean you doubt me torres bristled heavens man francis protested but torres dashed on you mean that i am forbidden by you a man i have scarcely met from the councils of the Solanos, who are my oldest and most honored friends old enrico who had not missed the rising wrath against francis in leoncia's face succeeded in conveying a warning to her ere with a courteous gesture he hushed torres and began to speak there are no councils of the Solanos from which you are barred senor torres you are indeed an old friend of the family your late father and i were comrades almost brothers but that and you will pardon an old man's judgment 
does not prevent Signor Morgan from being right when he says your plan is hopeless. To storm the jail is truly madness. Look at the thickness of the walls. They could stand a siege for weeks. And yet, and I confess it, almost was I tempted when you first broached the idea. Now, when I was a young man, fighting the Indians in the high cordilleras, there was a very case in point. Come, let us all be seated and comfortable, and I will tell you the tale. But Torres, busy with many things, declined to wait, and with soothed amicable feelings shook hands all around, briefly apologized to Francis, and departed astride his silver-saddled and silver-bridled horse for San Antonio. One of the things that busied him was the cable correspondence maintained between him and Thomas Regan's Wall Street office. Having secret access to the Panamanian government wireless station at San Antonio, he was thus able to relay messages to the cable station at Veracruz. Not alone was his relationship with Regan proving lucrative, but it was jibing in with his own personal plans concerning Leoncia and the Morgans. What have you against Senor Torres that you should reject his plan and anger him? Leoncia demanded of Francis. Nothing, was the answer. Except that we do not need him, and that I am not exactly infatuated with him. He is a fool and would spoil any plan. Look at the way he fell down on testifying at my trial. Maybe he can't be trusted. I don't know. Anyway, what's the good of trusting him when we don't need him? Now his plan is all right. We'll go straight to the jail and take Henry out, if all you are game for it. And we don't need to trust to a mob of unhung rascals and beach sweepings. If the six men of us can't do it, we might as well quit. There must be at least a dozen guards always hanging out at the jail. Ricardo, Leoncia's youngest brother, a lad of eighteen, objected. Leoncia, her eagerness alive again, frowned at him, but Francis took his part. Well taken, he agreed. But we will eliminate the guards. The five-foot walls, said Martinez Solano, twin brother to Alvarado. Go through them, Francis answered. But how? Leoncia cried. That's what I am arriving at. You, Senor Solano, have plenty of saddle horses? Good. And you, Alessandro, does it chance you could procure me a couple of sticks of dynamite from around the plantation? Good, and better than good. And you, Leoncia, as the lady of the hacienda, should know whether you have in your storeroom a plentiful supply of that three-star rye whiskey? Ah, the plot thickens. <laughs> he laughed on receiving her assurance. We've all the properties for a Ryder Haggard or Rex Beach adventure tale. Now listen, but wait. I want to talk to you, Leoncia, about private theatricals. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of Hearts of Three by Jack London This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It was in the mid-afternoon, and Henry, at his barred cell window, stared out into the street and wondered if any sort of breeze would ever begin to blow off of Chiriqui Lagoon and cool the stagnant air. The street was dusty and filthy. Filthy because the only scavengers it had ever known since the town was founded centuries before were the carrion dogs and obscene buzzards even then prowling and hopping about in the debris. Low, whitewashed buildings of stone and adobe made the street a furnace. The white of it all, and the dust, was almost achingly intolerable to the eyes, and Henry would have withdrawn his gaze had not the several ragged mozos, dozing in a doorway opposite, suddenly aroused and looked interestedly up the street. Henry could not see, but he could hear the rattling spokes of some vehicle coming at speed, Next is surged into view, a rattletrap light wagon drawn by a runaway horse. In the seat, 
a grey-headed grey-bearded ancient strove vainly to check the animal henry smiled and marvelled that the rickety wagon could hold together so prodigious were the bumps imparted to it by the deep ruts every wheel half dished and threatening to dish wobbled and revolved out of line with every other wheel and if the wagon held intact henry judged it was a miracle that the crazy harness did not fly to pieces when directly opposite the window the old man made a last effort half standing up from the seat as he pulled on the reins one was rotten and broke as the driver fell backward into the seat his weight on the remaining rein caused the horse to swerve sharply to the right what happened then whether a wheel dished or whether a wheel had come off first and dished afterward henry could not determine the one incontestable thing was that the wagon was a wreck the old man dragging in the dust and stubbornly hanging on to the remaining rein swung the horse in a circle until it stopped facing him and snorting at him by the time he gained his feet a crowd of mozos was forming about him these were roughly shouldered right and left by the gendarmes who erupted from the jail henry remained at the window and for a man with but a few hours to live was an amused spectator and listener to what followed giving his horse to a gendarme to hold not stopping to brush the filth from his person the old man limped hurriedly to the wagon and began an examination of the several packing cases large and small which composed its load of one case he was especially solicitous even trying to lift it and seeming to listen as he lifted he straightened up on being addressed by one of the gendarmes and made voluble reply me alas signors i am an old man and far from home i am leopold of narvez it is true my mother was german may the saints preserve her rest but my father was baltazar de jesus y surveillos y Nobres, son of general narvez of martial memory who fought under the great bolivar himself and now i am half ruined and far from home prompted by other questions interlarded with the courteous expressions of sympathy with which even the humblest mozo is over generously supplied he managed to be politely grateful and to run on with his tale i have driven from bocas del toro he has taken me five days and business has been poor my home is in cologne and i wish i were safely there but even a noble narvez may be a peddler and even a peddler must live eh signors is it not so but tell me is there not a tomas romero who dwells in this pleasant city of san antonio there are any god's number of tomas romeros who dwell everywhere in panama laughed pedro zurita the assistant jailer one would need a fuller description he is the cousin of my second wife the ancient answered hopefully and seemed bewildered by the roar of laughter from the crowd and a dozen tomas romeros live in and about san antonio the assistant jailer went on any one of which may be your second wife's cousin senor there is tomas romero the drunkard there is tomas romero the thief there is tomas romero but no he was hanged a month back for murder and robbery there is the rich tomas romero who owns many cattle on the hills there is to each suggested one leopoldo narvaez had shaken his head dolefully until the cattle owner was mentioned at this he had become hopeful and broke in pardon me senor it must be he or some such one as he i shall find him if my precious stock in trade can be safely stored i shall seek him now it is well my misfortune came upon me where it did i shall be able to trust it with you who are one can see with half an eye an honest and an honourable man as he talked he fumbled forth from his pocket two silver pesos and handed them to the jailer there 
I, I wish you and your men to have some pleasure of assisting me. Henry grinned to himself as he noted the access of interest in the old man and of consideration for him on the part of Pedro Zurita and the gendarmes caused by the present of the coins. They shoved the more curious of the crowd roughly back from the wrecked wagon and began to carry the boxes into the jail. Careful, senors, careful, the old one pleaded, greatly anxious as they took hold of the big box. Handle it gently. It is of value, and it is fragile, most fragile. While the contents of the wagon were being carried into the jail, the old man removed and deposited in the wagon all harness from the horse save the bridle. Pedro Zurita ordered the harness taken in as well, explaining, with a glare at the miserable crowd, Not a strap or buckle would remain the second after our backs were turned. Using what was left of the wagon for a stepping block, and ably assisted by the jailer and his crew, the peddler managed to get astride his animal. It is well, he said, and added gratefully, A thousand thanks, signors. It has been my good fortune to meet with honest men with whom my goods will be safe. Only poor goods, peddler's goods, you understand. But to me, everything my way upon the road. The pleasure has been mine to meet you. Tomorrow I shall return with my kinsmen, whom I certainly shall find, and relieve from you the burden of safeguarding my inconsiderable property. He doffed his hat. Adios, senors, adios. He rode away at a careful walk, timid of the animal he bestrode which had caused his catastrophe. He halted and turned his head at a call from Pedro Zurita. Search the graveyard, senor Narvaez, the jailer advised. Full a hundred Tomas Romero's lie there. And be vigilant, I beg of you, senor of the heavy box the peddler called back henry watched the street grow deserted as the gendarmes and the populace fled from the scorch of the sun small wonder he thought to himself that the old peddler's voice had sounded vaguely familiar it had been because he had possessed only half a spanish tongue to twist around the language the other half being the german tongue of the mother even so he talked like a native he would be robbed like a native if there was anything of value in that heavy box deposited with the jailers henry concluded ere dismissing the incident from his mind in the guard room a scant fifty feet away from henry's cell leopoldo narvaez was being robbed it had begun by pedro zurita making a profound and wistful survey of the large box he lifted one end of it to sample its weight and sniffed like a hound at the crack of it, as if his nose might give him some message of its contents. Leave it alone, Pedro. One of the gendarmes laughed at him. You have been paid two pesos, to be honest. The assistant jailer sighed, walked away and sat down, looked back at the box, and sighed again. Conversation languished. Continually the eyes of the men roved to the box. A greasy pack of cards could not divert them. The game languished. The gendarme, who had twitted Pedro himself, went to the box and sniffed. I smell nothing, he announced. Absolutely, in the box there is nothing to smell. Now what can it be? The caballero said that it was of value. Caballero, sniffed another of the gendarmes. The old man's father was more like to have been peddler of rotten fish on the streets of Cologne, and his father before him. Every lying beggar claims descent from the conquistadores. And why not, Rafael? Pedro Zurita retorted. Are we not all so descended? Without doubt. Rafael readily agreed. The conquistadores slew many. And were the ancestors of those that survived? Pedro completed for him and aroused a general laugh. Just the same, almost would I give one of these pesos to know what is in that box. 
There is Ignacio. Raphael greeted the entrance of a turnkey whose heavy eyes tokened he was just out of his siesta. He was not paid to be honest. Come, Ignacio, relieve our curiosity by letting us know what is in the box. How should I know? Ignacio demanded, blinking at the object of interest. Only now have I awakened. You have not been paid to be honest, then? Raphael asked. Merciful Mother of God, who is the man who would pay me to be honest? The turnkey demanded. Then take the hatchet there and open the box. Raphael drove his point home. We may not, for as surely as Pedro is to share the two pesos with us, that surely have we been paid to be honest. Open the box, Ignacio, or we shall perish of our curiosity. We will look. We will only look. Pedro muttered nervously as the turnkey prized off a board with the blade of the hatchet. Then we will close the box again and... Put your hand in, Ignacio. What is it you find, eh? What does it feel like? Ah! After pulling and tugging, Ignacio's hand had reappeared, clutching a cardboard carton. Remove it carefully, for it must be replaced, the jailer cautioned. And when the wrappings of paper and tissue paper were removed, all eyes focused on a quart bottle of rye whiskey. How excellently is it composed, Pedro murmured in tones of awe. It must be very good that such care be taken of it. Ah, it is Americano whiskey, sighed a gendarme. Once only have I drunk Americano whiskey. It was wonderful. Such was the courage of it that I leaped into the bullring at Santos and faced a wild bull with my hands. It is true the bull rolled me, but did I not leap into the ring? Pedro took the bottle and prepared to knock its neck off. Hold! cried Raphael. You were paid to be honest. By a man who was not himself honest came the retort. The stuff is contraband. It has never paid duty. The old man was in possession of smuggled goods. Let us now gratefully and with clear conscience invest ourselves in its possession. We will confiscate it. We will destroy it. Not waiting for the bottle to pass, Ignacio and Raphael unwrapped fresh ones and broke off the necks. Three stars. Most excellent. Pedro Zurita orated in a pause pointing to the trademark. You see, all gringo whiskey is good. One star shows that it is very good. Two stars that it is excellent. Three stars that it is superb, the best, and better than beyond that. Ah, I know. The gringos are strong on strong drink. No pulque for them. And four stars? queried Ignacio, his voice husky from the liquor, the moisture glistening in his eyes. Four stars? Friend Ignacio, four stars would be either sudden death or translation into paradise. In not many minutes, Raphael, his arm around another gendarme, was calling him brother and proclaiming that it took little to make men happy here below. The old man was a fool, three times a fool, and thrice that, volunteered Augustino a sullen-faced gendarme, who, for the first time, gave tongue to speech. Viva Agostino! cheered Raphael. The three stars have worked a miracle. Behold, have they not unlocked Agostino's mouth? And thrice times thrice again was the old man a fool. Augustino bellowed fiercely. The very drink of the gods was his, all his... And he has been five days alone with it on the road from Bocas del Toro, and never taken one little sip. Such fools as he should be stretched out naked on an ant heap, say I. The old man was a rogue, quoth Pedro. And when he comes back tomorrow for his three stars, I shall arrest him for a smuggler. It will be a feather in all our caps. If we destroy the evidence, thus, queried Agostino, knocking off another neck. We will save the evidence, thus, 
Pedro replied, smashing an empty bottle on the stone flags. Listen, comrades, the box was very heavy. We are all agreed it fell. The bottles broke, the liquor ran out, and so were we made aware of the contraband. The box and the broken bottles will be evidence sufficient. The uproar grew as the liquor diminished. One gendarme quarreled with Ignacio over a forgotten debt of ten centavos. Two others sat upon the floor, arms around each other's necks, and wept over the miseries of their married lot. Augustino, like a very spendthrift of speech, explained his philosophy that silence was golden, and Pedro Zurita became sentimental on brotherhood. Even my prisoners, he maundered, I love them as brothers. Life is sad. A gush of tears in his eyes made him desist while he took another drink. My prisoners are my very children. My heart bleeds for them. Behold, I weep. Let us share with them. Let them have a moment's happiness. Ignacio, dearest brother of my heart, do me a favor. See, I weep on your hand. Carry a bottle of this elixir to the gringo Morgan. Tell him my sorrow that he must hang tomorrow. Give him my love and bid him drink and be happy today. And as Ignacio passed out on the errand, the gendarme who had once leapt into the bullring at Santos began roaring, I want a bull! I want a bull! He wants it, dear soul, that he may put his arms around it and love it, Pedro Zurita explained with a fresh access of weeping. I too love bulls. I love all things. I love even mosquitoes. All the world is love. That is the secret of the world. I should like to have a lion to play with. The unmistakable air of back to back against the mainmast being whistled openly in the street caught Henry's attention, and he was crossing his big cell to the window when the grating of a key in the door made him lie down quickly on the floor and feign sleep. Ignacio staggered drunkenly in, bottle in hand, which he gravely presented to Henry. With the high compliments of our good jailer, Pedro Zorita, he mumbled. He says to drink and forget that he must stretch your neck tomorrow. My high compliments to Signor Pedro Zorita, and tell him for me to go to hell along with his whiskey, Henry replied. The turnkey straightened up and ceased swaying, as if suddenly become sober. Very well, Signor, he said, then passed out and locked the door. In a rush, Henry was at the window, just in time to encounter Francis face to face, and thrusting a revolver to him through the bars. Greetings, camarada, Francis said. We'll have you out of here in a jiffy. He held up two sticks of dynamite with fuse and caps complete. I have brought this pretty crowbar to pry you out. Stand well back in your cell, because real pronto there's going to be a hole in this wall that we could sail the Angelique through, and the Angelique is right off the beach waiting for you. Now stand back. I'm going to touch her off. It's a short fuse. Hardly had Henry backed into a rear corner of his cell when the door was clumsily unlocked and opened to a babel of cries and imprecations, chiefest among which he could hear the ancient and invariable war cry of Latin America. Kill the gringo! Also, he could hear Rafael and Pedro as they entered, babbling. The one... He is the enemy of brotherly love. And the other, He said I was to go to hell. Is not that what he said, Ignacio? In their hands they carried rifles, and behind them urged the drunken rabble, variously armed, from cutlasses and horse pistols to hatchets and bottles. At sight of Henry's revolver they halted, and Pedro, fingering his rifle unsteadily, maundered solemnly. Signor Morgan, you are about to take up your rightful abode in hell. But Ignacio did not wait. He fired wildly and widely from his hip, missing Henry by half the width of the cell and going down the next moment under the impact of Henry's bullet. 
the rest retreated precipitately into the jail corridor where themselves unseen they began discharging their weapons into the room thanking his fortunate stars for the thickness of the walls and hoping no ricochet would get him henry sheltered in a protecting angle and waited for the explosion it came the window and the wall beneath it became all one aperture struck on the head by a flying fragment henry sank down dizzily and as the dust of the mortar and the powder cleared with wavering eyes he saw francis apparently swim through the hole by the time he had been dragged out through the hole henry was himself again he could see enrico solano and ricardo his youngest born rifles in hand holding back the crowd forming up the street while the twins alvarado and martinez similarly held back the crowd forming down the street but the populace was merely curious having its lives to lose and nothing to gain if it attempted to block the way of such masterful men as these who blew up walls and stormed jails in open day and it gave back respectfully before the compact group as it marched down the street the horses are waiting up the next alley francis told henry as they gripped hands and leoncia is waiting with them fifteen minutes gallop will take us to the beach where the boat is waiting say that was some song i taught you henry grinned it sounded like the very best little bit of all right when i heard you whistling it the dogs were so previous they couldn't wait till tomorrow morning to hang me they got full of whiskey and decided to finish me off right away funny thing that whiskey an old caballero turned peddler wrecked a wagon load of it right in front of the jail for even a noble narvez son of balthazar de jesus y cervellos y narvez son of general narvez of martial memory may be a peddler and even a peddler must live eh senors is it not so francis mimicked henry looked his gleeful recognition and added soberly francis i'm glad for one thing most damn glad which is francis queried in the pause just as they swung around the corner to the horses that i didn't cut your ears off that day on the calf when i had you down and you insisted End of chapter 5「Mariano Percara e Hijos, jefe político of San Antonio, leaned back in his chair in the courtroom and with a quiet smile of satisfaction proceeded to roll a cigarette. The case had gone through as prearranged. He had kept the little old judge away from his mescal all day and had been rewarded by having the judge try the case and give judgment according to program. He had not made a slip. The six peons, fined heavily, were ordered back to the plantation at Santos. The working out of the fines was added to the time of their contract slavery, and the jefe was two hundred dollars good American gold, richer for the transaction. Those gringos at Santos, he smiled to himself, were men to tie to. True, they were developing the country with their Hennequin plantation, but better than that, they possessed money in untold quantity and paid well for such little services as he might be able to render. His smile was even broader as he greeted Alvarez Torres. Listen, said the latter, whispering low in his ear. We can get both these devils of Morgans. The Henry Pig hangs tomorrow. There is no reason that the Francis Pig should not go out today. The jefe remained silent, questioning with a lift of his eyebrows. I have advised him to storm the jail. The Solanos have listened to his lies and are with him. They will surely attempt to do it this evening. They could not do it sooner. It is for you to be ready for the event and to see to it that Francis Morgan is especially shot and killed in the fight. For what and for why? The jefe temporized. It is Henry I want to see out of the way. Let the Francis one go back to his beloved New York. 
he must go out today, and for reasons you will appreciate. As you know, from reading my kilograms through the government wireless, which was our agreement for my getting you your permission to use the government station, the jefe reminded, and of which I do not complain, Torres assured him. But as I was saying, you know my relations with the New York Regan are confidential and important. He touched his hand to his breast pocket. I have just received another wire. It is imperative that the Francis Pig be kept away from New York for a month, if forever, and I do not misunderstand Signor Regan, so much the better. In so far as I succeed in this, will you fare well? But you have not told me how much you have received, nor how much you will receive. The Hefe probed. It is a private agreement, and it is not so much as you may fancy. He is a hard man, this Signor Regan, a hard man. Yet will I divide fairly with you out of the success of our adventure. The Hefe nodded acquiescence, then said, Will it be as much as a thousand gold you will get? I think so. Surely the pig of an Irish stock gambler could pay me no less a sum and five hundred is yours if Pig Francis leaves his bones in San Antonio. Will it be as much as a hundred thousand gold? Was the jefe's next query. Torres laughed as if at a joke. <laughs> it must be more than a thousand. The other persisted. And he may be generous. Torres responded. He may even give me five hundred over a thousand, half of which, naturally, as I have said, will be yours as well. I shall go from here immediately to the jail, the jefe announced. You may trust me, Senor Torres, as I trust you. Come, we will go at once, now, you and I, and you may see for yourself the preparation I shall make for this Francis Morgan's reception. I have not yet lost my cunning with a rifle, and, as well, I shall tell off three of the gendarmes to fire only at him. So this gringo dog would storm our jail, eh? Come, we will depart at once. He stood up, tossing his cigarette away with a show of determined energy. But halfway across the room, a ragged boy, panting and sweating, plucked his sleeve and whined, I have information. You will pay me for it, most high, senor. I run all the way. I'll have you sent to San Juan for the buzzards to peck your carcass for the worthless carrion that you are, was the reply. The boy quailed at the threat, then summoned courage from his emptiness of belly and meagerness of living, and from his desire for the price of a ticket to the next school fight. You will remember I brought you the information, senor. I ran all the way until I am almost dead, as you can behold, senor. I will tell you, but you will remember it was I who ran all the way and told you first. Yes, yes, animal, I will remember. But woe to you if I remember too well. What is this trifling information? It may not be worth a centavo, and if it isn't, I'll make you sorry the sun ever shone on you and buzzard picking of you at San Juan will be paradise compared with what I shall visit on you. The jail. The boy quavered. The strange gringo, the one who was to be hanged yesterday, has blown down the side of the jail. Merciful saints, the hole is as big as the steeple of the cathedral. And the other gringo, the one who looks like him, the one who was to hang tomorrow, has escaped with him out of the hole. He dragged him out of the hole himself. This I saw myself with my two eyes, and then I ran here to you all the way, but you will remember. But the jefe politico had already turned on Torres witheringly. And if the senor Regan be princely generous, he may give you and me the munificent sum that was mentioned, eh? Five times the sum, or ten times, with this gringo tiger blowing down law and order, and our good jail walls would be nearer the mark. At any rate, 
The thing must be a false alarm. Merely the straw that shows which way blows the wind of this Francis Morgan's intention. Torres murmured with a sickly smile. Remember, the suggestion was mine to him to storm the jail. In which case, you and Senor Regan will pay for the good jail wall. The Hefte demanded, then, with a pause, added, not that i believe it has been accomplished it is not possible even a fool gringo would not dare rafael the gendarme rifle in hand the blood still oozing down his face from a scalp wound came through the courtroom door and shouldered aside the curious ones who had begun to cluster around torres and the jefe we are devastated were rafael's first words the jail is most destroyed dynamite a hundred pounds of it a thousand we came bravely to save the jail but it exploded the thousand pounds of dynamite i fell unconscious rifle in hand when sense came back to me i looked about all the others the brave pedro the brave ignacio the brave augustino all all lay around me dead almost could he have added drunk but his Latin American nature so compounded, he sincerely stated the catastrophe as it most valiantly and tragically presented itself to his imagination. They lay dead. They may not be dead, but merely stunned. I crawled. The cell of the Gringo Morgan was empty. There was a huge and monstrous hole in the wall. I crawled through the hole into the street. There was a great crowd but the gringo morgan was gone i talked with a mozo who had seen and who knew they had horses waiting they rode toward the beach there is a schooner that is not anchored it sails back and forth waiting for them the francis morgan rides with a sack of gold on his saddle the mozo saw it it is a large sack and the hole the jefe demanded the hole in the wall is larger than the sack much larger was rafael's reply but the sack is large so the mozo said and he rides with it on his saddle my jail the jefe cried he slipped a dagger from inside his coat under the left armpit and held it aloft by the blade so that the hilt showed as a true cross on which a finely modelled christ hung crucified i swear by all the saints the vengeance i shall have my jail our justice our law horses horses and arme horses he whirled about upon torres as if the latter had spoken shouting to hell with senor regan i am after my own i have been defied my jail is desolated my law our law good friends has been mocked horses horses commandeer them on the streets haste haste captain trefethen owner of the angelique son of a maya indian mother and a jamaica negro father paced the narrow after-deck of his schooner stared shoreward toward san antonio where he could make out his crowded longboat returning and meditated flight from his mad american charterer at the same time he meditated remaining in order to break his charter and give a new one at three times the price for he was strangely torn by his conflicting bloods the negro portion counselled prudence and observance of panamanian law the indian portion was urgent to unlawfulness and the promise of conflict it was the indian mother who decided the issue and made him draw his jib ease his main sheet and begin to reach inshore the quicker to pick up the oncoming boat when he made out the rifles carried by the solanos and the morgans almost he put up his helm to run for it and leave them when he made out a woman in the boat's stern sheets romance and thrift whispered in him to hang on and take the boat on board for he knew wherever women entered into the transactions of men that peril and pelf as well entered hand in hand and aboard came the woman the peril and the pelf leoncia the rifles and the sack of money all in a scramble 
for the wind being light the captain had not bothered to stop way on the schooner glad to welcome you on board sir captain trefethen greeted francis with a white slash of teeth between his smiling lips but who is this man he nodded his head to indicate henry a friend captain a guest of mine in fact a kinsman and who sir may i make bold to ask are those gentlemen riding along the beach in fashion so lively henry looked quickly at the group of horsemen galloping along the sand unceremoniously took the binoculars from the skipper's hand and gazed through them it's the hefe himself in the lead he reported to leoncia and her menfolk with a bunch of hindarmes he uttered a sharp exclamation stared through the glasses intently then shook his head almost i thought i made out our friend torres with our enemies leoncia cried incredulously remembering torres's proposal of marriage and proffer of service and honor that very day on the hacienda piazza i must have been mistaken francis acknowledged they are riding so bunched together but it's the jefe all right two jumps ahead of the outfit who is this torre stock henry asked harshly i've never liked his looks from the first yet he seems always welcome under your roof leoncio i beg your pardon sir most gratifiedly and with my humilious respects captain trefethen interrupted suavely but i must call your attention to the previous question sir which is who and what is that cavalcade desporting itself with such earnestness along the sand they tried to hang me yesterday francis laughed <laughs> and tomorrow they were going to hang my kinsman there only we beat them to it and here we are now mr skipper i call your attention to your head sheets flapping in the wind you are standing still how much longer do you expect to stick around here mr morgan sir came the answer it is with dumbfounded respect that i serve you as the charterer of my vessel nevertheless i must inform you that i am a british subject king george is my king sir and i owe obedience first of all to him and to his loss of maritime between all nations sir it is lucid to my comprehension that you have broken laws ashore or else the officers ashore would not be so assiduously in quest of you sir it is also lucid to clarification that it is now your wish to have me break the laws of maritime by enabling you to escape so in honor bound i must stick around until this little difficulty that you may have appertained ashore is adjusted to the satisfaction of all parties concerned sir and to the satisfaction of my lawful sovereign fill away and get out of this skipper henry broke in angrily sir assuring you of your gratification of pardon it is my unpleasant task to inform you of two things neither are you my charterer nor are you the noble king george to whom i give ambitious allegiance well i'm your charterer skipper francis said pleasantly for he had learned to humor the man of mixed words and parentage so just kindly put up your helm and sail us out of this shiriki lagoon as fast as god and this failing wind will let you it is not in the charter sir that my angelique shall break the laws of panama and king george i'll pay you well francis retorted beginning to lose his temper get busy you will then recharter sir at three times the present charter francis nodded shortly then wait sir i entreat i must procure pen and paper from the cabin and make out the document oh lord francis groaned square away and get a move on first we can make out the paper just as easily while we are running as standing still look they are beginning to fire 
the half-breed captain heard the report and searching his spread canvas discovered the hole of the bullet high up near the peak of the mainsail very well sir he conceded you are a gentleman and an honourable man i trust you to affix your signature to the document at your early convenience hey you nigger put up your wheel hard up jump you black rascals and slack away men sheet take a hand there you percival on the boom tackle all obeyed as did percival a grinning shambling kingston negro who was as black as his name was white and as did another addressed more respectfully as juan who was more spanish and indian than negro as his light yellow skin attested and whose fingers slacking the foresheet were as slim and delicate as a girl's knock the nigger on the head if he keeps up this freshness henry growled in an undertone to francis for two cents i'll do it right now but francis shook his head he's all right but he's a jamaica nigger and you know what they are and he's indian as well we might as well humor him since it's the nature of the beast he means all right but he wants the money he's risking his schooner against confiscation and he's afflicted with vocabularitis he just must get those long words out of his system or else bust here enrico solano with quivering nostrils and fingers restless on his rifle as with half an eye he kept track of the wild shots being fired from the beach approached henry and held out his hand i have been guilty of a grave mistake senor morgan he said in the first heard of my affliction at the death of my beloved brother alfaro i was guilty of thinking you guilty of his murder here old enrico's eyes flashed with anger consuming but unconsumable for murder it was dastardly and cowardly a thrust in the dark in the back i should have known better but i was overwhelmed and the evidence was all against you i did not take pause of thought to consider that my dearly beloved and only daughter was betrothed to you to remember that all i have known of you was straightness and manlikeness and courage such as never stabs from behind the shield of the dark i regret i am sorry and i am proud once again to welcome you into my family as the husband-to-be of my leoncia and while this wholehearted restoration of henry morgan into the solano family went on leoncia was irritated because her father in latin american fashion must use so many fine words and phrases when a simple phrase a hand grip and a square look in the eyes were all that was called for and was certainly all that either henry or francis would have vouchsafed had the situation been reversed why why she asked of herself must her spanish stock in such extravagance of diction seem to emulate the similar extravagance of the jamaica negro while this reiteration of the betrothal of henry and leoncia was taking place francis striving to appear uninterested could not help taking note of the pale yellow sailor called juan conferring forward with others of the crew shrugging his shoulders significantly gesticulating passionately with his hands End of chapter six chapter seven of hearts of three by jack london this librivox recording is in the public domain and now we have lost both the gringo peaks Avres torres lamented on the beach as with a slight freshening of the breeze and with booms winged out to port and starboard the angelique passed out of range of their rifles almost would i give three bells to the cathedral mariano vercara e hijos proclaimed to have them within a hundred yards of this rifle and if i had will of all gringos they would depart so fast that the devil in hell would be compelled to study english alvarez torres beat the saddle pommel with his hand in sheer impotence of rage and disappointment the queen of my dreams he almost wept she is gone away off with the two morgans 
I saw her climb up the side of the schooner, and there is the New York Raven. Once out to Cherokee Lagoon, the schooner may sail directly to New York, and the Francis Pig will not have been delayed a month, and the Signor Regan will remit no money. They will not get out of Cherokee Lagoon, the Hefe said solemnly. I am no animal without reason. I am a man. I know they will not get out. Have I not sworn eternal vengeance? The sun is setting, and the promise is for a night of little wind. The sky tells it to one with half an eye. Behold those trailing wisps of clouds. What wind may be, and little enough of that, will come from the northeast. It will be a headbeat to the Carrera Passage. They will not attempt it. That nigger captain knows the lagoon like a book. He will try to make the long tack and go out past Bogas del Toro or through the Cartago Passage. Even so, we will outwit him. I have brains, reason. Reason, listen. It is a long ride. We will make it straight down the coast to Las Palmas. Captain Rosaro is there with the Dolores. The second-hand old tugboat? They cannot get out of her own way? Torres queried. But this night of calm and morrow of calm, she will capture the Angelique. The Hefe replied. On, comrades, you will ride. Captain Rosaro is my friend. Any favor is but mine to ask. At daylight, the worn-out men on beaten horses straggled through the decaying village of Las Palmas and down to the decaying pier, where a very decayed-looking tugboat, sadly in need of paint, welcomed their eyes. Smoke rising from the stack advertised that the steam was up, and the jefe was wearily elated. A happy morning, Senor Capitan Rosaro, and well met. He greeted the hard-bitten Spanish skipper, who was reclined on a coil of rope and who sipped black coffee from a mug that rattled against his teeth. It would be a happier morning if the cursed fever had not laid its chill upon me. Captain Rosaro grunted sourly, the hand that held the mug, the arm, and all his body shivering so violently as to spill the hot liquid down his chin and into the black and gray thatch of hair that covered his half-exposed chest. Take that, you animal of hell! He cried, flinging mug and contents at the splinter of a half-breed boy, evidently his servant, who had been unable to repress his glee. But the sun will rise, and the fever will work its will, and shortly depart, said the jefe, politely ignoring the display of spleen. And you are finished here, and you are bound for Bolgas del Toro, and we shall go with you all of us, on a rare adventure. We will pick up the schooner Angelique, calm-bound all last night in the lagoon. And I shall make many arrests, and all Panama will so ring with your courage and ability, Capitan, that you will forget that the fever ever whispered in you. How much? Capitan Rosaro demanded bluntly. Much? The jefe countered in surprise. This is an affair of government, good friend, and it is right on your way to Bogas del Toro. It will not cost you an extra shovel full of coal. Muchacho, more coffee! The tug skipper roared at the boy. A pause fell, wherein Torres and the jefe and all the draggled following yearned for the piping hot coffee brought by the boy. Captain Rosaro played the rim of the mug against his teeth like a rattling of castanets, but managed to sip without spilling and so to burn his mouth. A vacant-faced Swede in filthy overalls, with a soiled cap on which appeared engineer, came up from below, lighted a pipe, and seemingly went into a trance as he sat on the tug's low rail. How much? Captain Rosaro repeated. Let us get under way, dear friend, said the jefe. And then, when the fever shock has departed, we will discuss the matter with reason, being reasonable creatures ourselves, and not animals. 
How much? Captain Rosaro repeated again. I am never an animal. I always am a creature of reason, whether the sun is up or not, or whether this thrice accursed fever is upon me. How much? Well, let us start. And for how much? The jefe conceded wearily. Fifty dollars gold. Was the prompt answer. You are starting anyway, are you not, Capitan? Torres queried softly. Fifty gold, as I have said. The jefe politico threw up his hands with a hopeless gesture and turned on his heel to depart. Yet you swore eternal vengeance for the crime committed on your jail. Torres reminded him. But not if it costs fifty dollars. The jefe snapped back out of the corner of his eye watching the shivering captain for some sign of relenting. Fifty gold, said the captain as he finished draining the mug and with shaking fingers strove to roll a cigarette. He nodded his head in the direction of the Swede and added, And five gold extra for my engineer. It is our custom. Torres stepped closer to the jefe and whispered, I will pay for the tug myself and charge the gringo rig in a hundred, and you and I will divide the difference. We lose nothing. We shall make for this rig and pig instructed me well not to mind expense. As the sun slipped brazenly above the eastern horizon, one gendarme went back into Las Palmas with the jaded horses. The rest of the party descended to the deck of the tug. The Swede dived down into the engine room, and Captain Rosaro, shaking off his chill in the sun's beneficent rays, ordered the deckhands to cast off the lines and put one of them at the wheel in the pilot house. And the same day, Dawn found the Angelique, after a night of almost perfect calm, off the mainland from which she had failed to get away, although she had made sufficient northing to be midway between San Antonio and the passages of Bocas del Toro and Cartago. These two passages to the open sea still lay twenty-five miles away, and the schooner truly slept on the mirror surface of the placid lagoon. Too stuffy below for sleep in the steaming tropics, the deck was littered with the sleepers. On top the small house of the cabin, in solitary state, lay Leoncia. On the narrow runways of deck on either side lay her brothers and her father. Aft, between the cabin companionway and the wheel, side by side, Francis's arm across Henry's shoulder, as if still protecting him, were the two Morgans. On one side of the wheel, sitting with arms on knees and head on arms, the Negro Indian skipper slept, and just as precisely postured, on the other side of the wheel, slept the helmsman, who was none other than Percival, the black Kingston Negro. The waist of the schooner was strewn with the bodies of the mixed-breed seamen, while forward, on the tiny forecastle head, prone, his face buried upon his folded arms, slept the lookout. Leoncia, in her high place on the cabin top, awoke first. Propping her head on her hand, the elbow resting on a bit of the poncho on which she lay, she looked down past one side of the hood of the companionway upon the two young men. She yearned over them, who were so alike, and knew love for both of them, remembered the kisses of Henry on her mouth, thrilled till the blush of her own thoughts mantled her cheek at memory of the kisses of Francis, and was puzzled and amazed that she should have it in her to love two men at the one time. As she had already learned of herself, she would follow Henry to the end of the world, and Francis even farther and she could not understand such wantonness of inclination. Fleeing from her own thoughts, which frightened her, she stretched out her arm and dangled the end of her silken scarf to a tickling of Francis's nose, who, after restless movements, still in the heaviness of sleep, struck with his hand at what he must have thought to be a mosquito or a fly, and hit Henry on the chest. 
so it was Henry who was first awakened. He sat up with such abruptness as to awaken Francis. Good morning, merry kinsman, Francis greeted. Why such violence? Morning, morning, and the morning's morning, comrade, Henry muttered. Such was the violence of your sleep that it was you who awakened me with a buffet on my breast. I thought it was the hangman, for this is the morning they planned to kink my neck. He yawned, stretched his arms, gazed out over the rail at the sleeping sea, and nudged Francis to observance of the sleeping skipper and helmsman. They looked so bonny, the pair of Morgans, Leoncia thought, and at the same time wondered why the English word had arisen unsummoned in her mind rather than a Spanish equivalent. Was it because her heart went out so generously to the two gringos that she must needs think of them in their language instead of her own? To escape the perplexity of her thoughts, she dangled the scarf again, was discovered, and laughingly confessed that it was she who had caused their violence of waking. Three hours later, breakfast of coffee and fruit over, she found herself at the wheel, taking her first lesson of steering and of the compass under Francis's tuition. The Angelique, under a crisp little breeze which had hauled around well to northard, was for the moment heeling it through the water at a six-knot clip. Henry, swaying on the weather side of the afterdeck and searching the sea through the binoculars, was striving to be all unconcerned at the lesson, although secretly he was mutinous with himself for not having first thought of himself introducing her to the binnacle and the wheel. Yet he resolutely refrained from looking around or from even stealing a corner-of-the-eye glance at the other two. But Captain Trefethen, with the keen cruelty of Indian curiosity and the impudence of a negro subject of King George, knew no such delicacy. He stared openly and missed nothing of the chemic drawing together of his charterer and the pretty Spanish girl. When they leaned over the wheel to look into the binnacle, they leaned toward each other, and Leoncia's hair touched Francis's cheek, and the three of them, themselves and the breed skipper, knew the thrill induced by such contact. But the man and woman knew immediately what the breed skipper did not know, and what they knew was embarrassment. Their eyes lifted to each other in a flash of mutual startlement, and drooped away and down guiltily. Francis talked very fast and loud enough for half the schooner to hear as he explained the lubber's point of the compass. But Captain Trefethen grinned. A rising puff of breeze made Francis put the wheel up. His hand to the spoke rested on her hand already upon it. Again they thrilled, and again the skipper grinned. Leoncia's eyes lifted to Francis's, then dropped in confusion. She slipped her hand out from under and terminated the lesson by walking slowly away with a fine assumption of casualness, as if the wheel and the binnacle no longer interested her. But she had left Francis afire with what he knew was lawlessness and treason as he glanced at Henry's shoulder and profile and hoped he had not seen what had occurred. Leoncia, apparently gazing off across the lagoon to the jungle-clad shore, was seeing nothing as she thoughtfully turned her engagement ring around and around on her finger. But Henry, turning to tell them of the smudge of smoke he had discovered on the horizon, had inadvertently seen, and the Negro Indian captain had seen him see. So the captain lurched close to him the cruelty of the Indian dictating the impudence of the negro, as he said in a low voice, Ah, be not downcast, sir. The senorita is generously hearted. There is room for both you gallant gentlemen in her heart. And the next fraction of a second, he learned the inevitable and invariable lesson that white men must have their privacy of intimate things, for he lay on his back, the back of his head sore from contact with the deck, the front of his head, between the eyes, sore from contact with the knuckles of Henry Morgan's right hand. 
but the indian in the skipper was up and raging as he sprang to his feet knife in hand juan the pale yellow mixed breed leaped to the side of his skipper flourishing another knife while several of the nearer sailors joined in forming a semicircle of attack on henry who with a quick step back and an upward slap of his hand under the pinrail caused an iron belaying pin to leap out and up into the air catching it in mid-flight he was prepared to defend himself francis abandoning the wheel and drawing his automatic as he sprang was through the circle and by the side of henry what did he say francis demanded of his kinsman i'll say what i said the breed skipper threatened the negro side of him dominant as he built for a compromise of blackmail i said hold on skipper henry interrupted i'm sorry i struck you hold your hush put a stopper on your jaw saw wood forget i'm sorry i struck you i Henry Morgan could not help the pause in speech during which he swallowed his gorge, rising at what he was about to say, and it was because of Leoncia, and because she was looking on and listening that he said it. I... I apologize, Skipper. It is an injury, Captain Trefethen stated aggrievedly. It is a physical damage no man can perpetrate a physical damage on a subject of king george's god bless him without furnishing a money requital at this crass statement of the terms of the blackmail henry was for forgetting himself and for leaping upon the creature but restrained by francis's hand on his shoulder he struggled to self-control made a noise like hearty laughter dipped into his pocket for two ten-dollar gold pieces and as if they stung him thrust them into captain trefethen's palm cheap at the price he could not help muttering aloud it is a good price the skipper averred twenty gold is always a good price for a sore head i am yours to command sir you are a sure enough gentleman you may hit me any time for the price me sir me the kingston black named percival volunteered with broad and prideless chucklings of subservience take a swat at me sir for the same price any time now and you may swat me as often as you please to pay but the episode was destined to terminate at that instant for at that instant a sailor called from amidships smoke a steamer smoke did aft the passage of an hour determined the nature and import of the smoke for the angelique falling into a calm was overhauled with such rapidity that the tugboat dolores at half a mile distant through the binoculars was seen fairly to bristle with armed men crowded on her tiny forward deck both henry and francis could recognize the faces of the jefe politico and of several of the gendarmes old enrico solano's nostrils began to dilate as with his four sons who were aboard he stationed them aft with him and prepared for the battle leoncia divided between henry and francis was secretly distracted though outwardly she joined in laughter at the unkemptness of the little tug and in glee at a flaw of wind that tilted the angelique's port rail flush to the water and foamed her along at a nine-knot clip but weather and wind were erratic. The face of the lagoon was vexed with squalls and alternate streaks of calm. We cannot escape, sir. I regret to inform you. Captain Trefethen informed Francis. If the wind would hold, sir, yes. But the wind baffles and breaks. We are crowded down upon the mainland. We are cornered, sir, and as good as captured henry who had been studying the near shore through the glasses lowered them and looked at francis shout cried the latter you have a scheme it's sticking out all over you name it right there are the two tigris islands henry elucidated they guard the narrow entrance to washington inlet which is called el tigre oh it has the teeth of a tiger believe me 
On either side of them, between them and the shore, it is too shoal to float a whaleboat unless you know the winding channels, which I do know. But between them is deep water, though the El Tigre passage is so pinched that there is no room to come about. A schooner can only run in it with the wind abaft or abeam. Now the wind favors, we will run it, which is only half my scheme. And if the wind baffles or fails, sir? And the tide of the inlet runs out and in like a race, as I well know. My beautiful schooner will go on the rocks. Captain Trefethen protested. For which, if it happens, I will pay you full value. Francis assured him shortly and brushed him aside. And now, Henry, what's the other half of your scheme? I'm ashamed to tell you. <laughs> Henry laughed but it will be provocative of more Spanish swearing than has been heard in Chiriqui Lagoon since old Sir Henry sacked San Antonio and Bocas del Toro. You just watch. Leoncia clapped her hands as with sparkling eyes she cried, It must be good, Henry. I can see it by your face. You must tell me. And aside, his arm around her to steady her on the reeling deck, Henry whispered closely in her ear, while Francis, to hide his perturbation at the sight of them, made shift through the binoculars to study the faces on the pursuing tug. Captain Trefethen grinned maliciously and exchanged significant glances with the pale yellow sailor. Now, Skipper, said Henry, returning. We're just opposite El Tigre. Put up your helm and run for the passage. Also, and pronto, I want a coil of half-inch old soft manila rope. Plenty of rope, yarns and sail twine, that case of beer from the lazarette, that five-gallon kerosene can that was emptied last night, and the coffee pot from the galley. But I am destrained to remark to your attention that that rope is worth good money, sir. Captain Trefethen complained, as Henry set to work on the heterogeneous gear. You will be paid. Francis hushed him. And the coffee pot. It is almost new. You will be paid. The skipper sighed and surrendered, although he sighed again at Henry's next act, which was to uncork the bottles and begin emptying the beer out into the scuppers. Please, sir, begged Percival. If you must empty the beer, please empty it in a me. No further beer was wasted, and the crew swiftly laid the empty bottles beside Henry. At intervals of six feet, he fastened the recorked bottles to the half-inch line. Also, he cut off two fathom lengths of the line and attached them like streamers between the beer bottles. The coffee pot and two empty coffee tins were likewise added among the bottles. To one end of the main line, he made fast the kerosene can. To the other end, the empty beer case, and looked up to Francis, who replied, Oh, I got you five minutes ago. El Tigre must be narrow, or else the tongue will go around that stuff. El Tigre is just that narrow, was the response. There's one place where the channel isn't forty feet between the shoals. If the skipper misses our trap, he'll go round aground. Say, they'll be able to wade ashore from the tug if that happens. Come on now, we'll get the stuff aft and ready to toss out. You take starboard, and I'll take port, and when I give you the word, you shoot that beer case out to the side as far as you can. Though the wind eased down, the Angelique, square before it, managed to make five knots, while the Dolores, doing six, slowly overhauled her. As the rifles began to speak from the Dolores, the skipper, under the direction of Henry and Francis, built up on the schooner's stern a low barricade, of sacks of potatoes and onions, of old sails, and of hawser coils. Crouching low in the shelter of this, the helmsman managed to steer. Leoncia refused to go below as the firing became more continuous, but compromised by lying down behind the cabin house. The rest of the sailors sought similar shelter in nooks and corners, while the Solano men, lying aft, returned the fire of the tug. Henry and Francis, in their chosen positions, and waiting until the narrowness of El Tigre was reached, took a hand in the free and easy battle. 
my congratulations sir captain trefethen said to francis the indian of him compelling him to raise his head to peer across the rail the negro of him flattening his body down until almost it seemed to bore into the deck that was captain rosaro himself that was steering and the way he jumped and grabbed his hand would lead one to conclude that you had very adequately put a bullet through it that captain rosaro is a very hot-tempered hombre sir i can almost hear him blaspheming now stand ready for the word francis henry said laying down his rifle and carefully studying the low shores of the islands of el tigre on either side of them we're almost ready take your time when i give the word and at three let her go the tug was two hundred yards away and overtaking fast when henry gave the word he and francis stood up and at three made their fling to either side can and beer case flew dragging behind them through the air the beaded rope of pots and cans and bottles and rope streamers in their interest henry and francis remained standing in order to watch the maw of their trap as denoted by the spread of miscellaneous objects on the surface of their troubled wake a fusillade of rifle shots from the tug made them drop back flat to the deck but peering over the rail they saw the tug's forefoot press the floated rope down and under a minute later they saw the tug slow down to a stop some mess wrapped around that propeller francis applauded henry salute now if the wind holds said henry modestly the angelique sailed on leaving the motionless tug to grow smaller in the distance but not so small that they could not see her drift helplessly on to the shoal and see men going over the side and wading about. We just must sing our little song, Henry cried jubilantly, starting up the stave of back to back against the mainmast. Roaring wind and deep blue water, we're the jolly devils who, back to back against the mainmast, held at bay the entire crew which is all very nice sir captain trefethen interrupted at the conclusion of the first chorus his eyes glistening and his shoulders still jiggling to the rhythm of the song but the wind has ceased sir we are becalmed how are we to get out of huchitan inlet without wind the dolores is not wrecked she is merely delayed some nigger will go down and clear her propeller and then she has us right where she wants us. It's not so far to shore, Henry adjudged with a measuring eye as he turned to Enrico. What kind of a shore have they got ashore here, Signor Solano? He queried. Maya Indians or Haciendados? Which? Haciendados and Mayas both. Enrico answered. But I know the country well. If the schooner is not safe, we should be safe ashore. We can get horses and saddles and beef and corn. The Cordilleras are beyond. What more should we want? But Leoncia? Francis asked solicitously. Was born in the saddle, and in the saddle there are few Americanos you would not weary. Came Enrico's answer. It would be well, with your acquiescence, to swing out the longboat in case the Dolores appears upon us. End of chapter 7、Chapter、eight of Hearts of Three by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It's all right, Skipper, it's all right. Henry assured the breed captain, who, standing on the beach with them, seemed loath to say farewell and pull back to the Angelique, adrift half a mile away in the dead calm which had fallen on Hutitan Inlet. It is what we call a diversion, Francis explained. That is a nice word, diversion. And it is even nicer when you see it work. But if it don't work, Captain Trefethen protested. Then it will spell a confounded word which I may name as catastrophe. 
That is what happened to the Dolores when we tangled her propeller. Henry laughed. But we do not know the meaning of that word. We use diversion instead. The proof that it will work is that we are leaving Senor Solano's two sons with you. Alvarado and Martinez know the passages like a book. They will pilot you out with the first favoring breeze. The jefe is not interested in you. He is after us. And when we take to the hills, he'll be on our trail with every last man of his. Don't you see? Francis broke in. The Angelique is trapped. If we remain on board, he will capture us and the Angelique as well. But we make the diversion of taking to the hills. He pursues us. The Angelique goes free. And of course, he won't catch us. But suppose I do lose the schooner. The swarthy skipper persisted. If she goes on the rocks, I will lose her. And the passages are very perilous. Then you will be paid for her, as I've told you before. Francis said with a show of rising irritation. Also are there my numerous expenses. Francis pulled out a pad and pencil, scribbled a note, and passed it over, saying, Present that to Signor Melchor Gonzalez at Bocas del Toro. It is for a thousand gold. He is the banker. He is my agent, and he will pay it to you. Captain Trefethen stared incredulously at the scrawled bit of paper. Oh, he's good for it, Henry said. Yes, sir, I know, sir, that Mr. Francis Morgan is a wealthy gentleman of renown. But how wealthy is he? Is he as wealthy as I modestly am? I own the Angelique, free of all debt. I own two town lots, unimproved in Cologne. I own four waterfront lots in Berlin. That will make me very wealthy when the Union Fruit Company begins the building of the warehouses. How much, Francis, did your father leave you? Henry quipped teasingly. Or rather, how many? Francis shrugged his shoulders as he answered vaguely. More than I have fingers and toes. Dollars, sir? queried the captain. Henry shook his head sharply. Thousands, sir? Again, Henry shook his head. Millions, sir? Now you're talking, Henry answered. Mr. Francis Morgan is rich enough to buy almost all the Republic of Panama, with the canal cut out of the deal. The Negro Indian mariner looked his unbelief to Enrico Solano, who replied, he is an honorable gentleman. I know. I have cashed his paper, drawn on Senor Melchor Gonzalez at Bocas de Toro, for a thousand pesos. There it is, in the bag there. He nodded his head up the beach to where Leoncia, in the midst of the dunnage landed with them, was toying with trying to slip cartridges into a Winchester rifle. The bag, which the skipper had long since noted, lay at her feet in the sand. I do hate to travel strapped, Francis explained embarrassedly to the white men of the group. One never knows when a dollar mayn't come in handy. I got caught with a broken machine at Smith River Cummers up New York way one night with nothing but a checkbook, and do you know I couldn't even get a cigarette in the town. I trusted a white gentleman in Barbados once who chartered my boat to go fishing flying fish. The captain began. Well, so long, skipper. Henry shut him off. You'd better be getting on board, because we're going to hike. And for Captain Trefethen, staring at the backs of his departing passengers, remained not but to obey. Helping to shove the boat off, he climbed in, took the steering sweep, and directed his course toward the Angelique. Glancing back from time to time, he saw the party on the beach shoulder the baggage and disappear into the dense green wall of vegetation. They came out upon an inchoate clearing and saw gangs of peons at work chopping down and grubbing out the roots of the virgin tropic forest so that rubber trees for the manufacture of automobile tires might be planted to replace it. Leoncia, beside her father, walked in the lead. Her brothers, Ricardo and Alessandro, in the middle, were burdened with the dunnage, as were Francis and Henry, who brought up the rear. 
and this strange procession was met by a slender straight-backed hidalgo appearing elderly gentleman who leaped his horse across tree trunks and stump holes in order to gain to them he was off his horse at sight of enrico sombrero in hand in recognition of leoncia his hand extended to enrico in greeting of ancient friendship his lips wording words and his eyes expressing admiration to enrico's daughter the talk was rapid-fire spanish and the request for horses proffered and qualifiedly granted ere the introduction of the two morgans took place the haciendado's horse after the latin fashion was immediately leoncia's and without ado he shortened the stirrups and placed her astride in the saddle a murrain he explained had swept his plantation of riding animals but his chief overseer still possessed a fair-conditioned one which was enrico's as soon as it could be procured his handshake to henry and francis was hearty as well as dignified as he took two full minutes ornately to state that any friend of his dear friend enrico was his friend when enrico asked the haciendado about the trails up toward the cordilleras and mentioned oil francis pricked up his ears don't tell me senor he began that they have located oil in panama they have the haciendado nodded gravely we knew of the oil ooze and had known of it for generations but it was the hermosillo company that sent its gringo engineers in secretly and then bought up the land they say it is a great field but i know nothing of oil myself they have many wells and have bored much and so much oil they have that it is running away over the landscape they say they cannot choke it entirely down such is the volume and pressure what they need is the pipeline to ocean carriage which they have begun to build in the meantime it flows away down the canyons and at a loss of incredible proportion have they built any tanks francis demanded his mind running eagerly on tampico petroleum to which most of his own fortune was pledged and of which despite the rising stock market he had heard nothing since his departure from new york the haciendado shook his head transportation he explained the freight from tidewater to the gushes by muleback has been prohibitive but they have impounded much of it they have lakes of oil great reservoirs in the hollows of the hills earthen dammed and still they cannot choke down the flow and still the precious substance flows down the canyons have they roofed these reservoirs francis inquired remembering a disastrous fire in the early days of tampico petroleum no senor francis shook his head disapprovingly they should be roofed he said a match from the drunken or revengeful hand of any peon could set the whole works off it's poor business poor business but i am not the hermosillo the haciendado said for the hermosillo company i meant senor francis explained i am an oil man i have paid through the nose to the tune of hundreds of thousands for similar accidents or crimes one never knows just how they happen what one does know is that they do happen what more francis might have said about the expediency of protecting oil reserves from stupid or wilful peons was never to be known for at the moment the chief overseer of the plantation stick in hand rode up half his interest devoted to the newcomers the other half to the squad of peons working close at hand senor ramirez will you favor me by dismounting his employer the haciendado politely addressed him at the same time introducing him to the strangers as soon as he had dismounted the animal is yours friend enrico the haciendado said if it dies please return to easy convenience the saddling gear and if your convenience be not easy please do not remember that there is to be any return save ever and always of your love for me i regret that you and your party cannot now partake of my hospitality but the hefe is a bloodhound i know 
We shall do our best to send him astray. With Leoncia and Enrico mounted, and the gear made fast to the saddles by leather thongs, the cavalcade started, Alessandro and Ricardo clinging each to the stirrup of their father's saddle and trotting alongside. This was for making greater haste, and was emulated by Francis and Henry, who clung to Leoncia's stirrups. Fast to the pommel of her saddle was the bag of silver dollars. It is some mistake, the haciendado was explaining to his overseer. Enrico Solano is an honorable man. Anything to which he pledges himself is honorable. He has pledged himself to this, whatever it may be, and yet there is Mariano Vecara y Hios on their trail. We shall mislead him if he comes this way. And here he comes, the overseer remarked, without luck so far in finding horses. Casually, he turned on the laboring peons, and with horrible threats, urged them to do at least half a day's decent work in a day. From the corner of his eye, the haciendado observed the fast-walking group of men, with Alvarez Torres in the lead, but, as if he had not noticed, he conferred with his overseer about the means of grubbing out the particular stump the peons were working on. He returned the greeting of Torres pleasantly, and inquired politely, with a touch of devilry, if he led the party of men on some oil-prospecting adventure. No, senor, Torres answered. We are in search of senor Enrico Solano, his daughter, his sons, and two tall gringos with them. It is the gringos we want. They have passed this way, senor? Yes, they have passed. I imagined they, too, were in some oil excitement. Such was their haste that prevented them from courteously passing the time of day and stating their destination. Have they committed some offense? But I should not ask. Senor Enrico Solano is too honorable a man. Which way did they go? The jefe demanded, thrusting himself breathlessly forward from the rear of his gendarmes, with whom he had just caught up. And while the haciendado and his overseer temporized and prevaricated and indicated an entirely different direction, Torres noted one of the peons, leaning on his spade, listen intently. And still, while the jefe was being misled and was giving orders to proceed on the false scent, Torres flashed a silver dollar privily to the listening peon. The peon nodded his head in the right direction caught the coin unobserved, and applied himself to his digging at the root of the huge stump. Torres countermanded the jefe's order. We will go the other way, Torres said with a wink to the jefe. A little bird has told me that a friend here is mistaken, and that they have gone the other way. As the posse departed on the hot trail, the haciendado and his overseer looked at each other in consternation and amazement. The overseer made a movement of his lips for silence, and looked swiftly at the group of laborers. The offending peon was working furiously and absorbedly, but another peon, with a barely perceptible nod of head, indicated him to the overseer. "'There's the little bird,' the overseer cried striding to the traitor and shaking him violently. Out of the peon's rags flew the silver dollar. Aha! said the haciendado, grasping the situation. He has become suddenly affluent. This is horrible, that my peon should be wealthy. Doubtless he has murdered someone for all that sum. Beat him and make him confess. The creature, on his knees, the stick of the overseer raining blows on his head and back made confession of what he had done to earn the dollar. Beat him. Beat him some more. Beat him to death. The beast who betrayed my dearest friends. The haciendado urged placidly. But no. Caution. Do not beat him to death, but nearly so. We are short of labor now and cannot afford the full measure of our just resentment. Beat him to hurt him much, but that he shall be compelled to live work no more than a couple of days. 
of the immediately subsequent agonies adventures and misadventures of the peon a volume might be written which would be the epic of his life besides to be beaten nearly to death is not nice to contemplate or dwell upon let it suffice to tell that when he had received no more than part of his beating he wrenched free leaving half his rags in the overseer's grasp and fled madly for the jungle outfooting the overseer who was unused to rapid locomotion save when on a horse's back such was the speed of the wretched creature's flight spurred on by the pain of his lacerations and the fear of the overseer that plunging wildly on he overtook the solano party and plunged out of the jungle and into them as they were crossing a shallow stream and fell upon his knees whimpering for mercy he whimpered because of his betrayal of them but this they did not know and francis seeing his pitiable condition lingered behind long enough to unscrew the metal top from a pocket flask and revive him with a drink of half the contents then francis hastened on leaving the poor devil muttering inarticulate thanks ere he dived off into the sheltering jungle in a different direction but underfed overworked his body gave way and he sank down in collapse in the green covert next alvarez torres in the lead and tracking like a hound the gendarmes at his back the jefe panting in the rear from shortness of breath the pursuit arrived at the stream the footmarks of the peon still wet on the dry stones beyond the margin of the stream caught torres's eye in a trice by what little was left of his garments the peon was dragged out on his knees which portion of his anatomy he was destined to occupy much this day he begged for mercy and received his interrogation and he denied knowledge of the solano party he who had betrayed and been beaten but who had received only succor from those he had betrayed felt stir in him some atom of gratitude and good he denied knowledge of the solanos since in the clearing where he had sold them for the silver dollar torres's stick fell upon his head five times ten times and went on falling with the certitude that in all eternity there would be no cessation unless he told the truth and after all he was a miserable and wretched thing spirit broken by beatings from the cradle and the sting of torres's stick with the threat of the plenitude of the stick that meant the death his own owner the haciendado could not afford made him give in and point the way of the chase but his day of tribulation had only begun scarcely had he betrayed the solanos the second time and still on his knees when the haciendado with the posse of neighboring haciendados and overseers he had called to his help burst upon the scene astride sweating horses my peon senors announced the haciendado itching to be at him you maltreat him and why not demanded the jefe because he is mine to maltreat and i wish to do it myself the peon crawled and squirmed to the jefe's feet and begged and entreated not to be given up but he begged for mercy where there was no mercy certainly senor the jefe said to the haciendado we give him back to you we must uphold the law and he is your property besides we have no further use for him yet is he a most excellent peon senor he has done what no peon has ever done in the history of panama he has told the truth twice in one day his hands tied together in front of him and hitched by a rope to the horn of the overseer's saddle the peon was towed away on the back track with a certain apprehension that the worst of his beatings for that day was very imminent nor was he mistaken back at the plantation he was tied like an animal to a post of a barbed wire fence while his owner and the friends of his owner who had helped in the capture went into the hacienda to take their twelve o'clock breakfast after that 
he knew what he was to receive. But the barbed wire of the fence and the lame mare in the paddock behind it built an idea in the desperate mind of the peon. Though the sharp barbs of the wire again and again cut his wrist, he quickly sawed through his bonds, free save for the law, crawled under the fence, led the lame mare through the gate, mounted her barebacked, and, with naked heels tattooing her ribs, galloped her away toward the safety of the Cordilleras. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Hearts of Three by Jack London This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the meantime, the Solanos were being overtaken, and Henry teased Francis with, Here in the jungle is where dollars are worthless. They can buy neither fresh horses, nor can they repair these two spineless creatures, which must likewise be afflicted with the moraine that carried off the rest of the Haciendado's riding animals. I've never been in a place yet where money wouldn't work, Francis replied. But I suppose it could even buy a drink of water in hell, was Henry's retort. Leoncia clapped her hands. I don't know, Francis observed. I have never been there. Again, Leoncia clapped her hands. Just the same, I have an idea I can make dollars work in the jungle, and I'm going to try it right now. Francis continued, at the same time untying the coin sack from Leoncia's pommel. You go ahead and ride on. You must tell me, Leoncia insisted, and aside in her ear as she leaned to him from the saddle, he whispered what made her laugh again, while Henry, conferring with Enrico and his sons, inwardly berated himself for being a jealous fool. Before they were out of sight, Looking back, they saw Francis, with pad and pencil out, writing something. What he wrote was eloquently brief, merely the figure, fifty. Tearing off the sheet, he laid it conspicuously in the middle of the trail, and weighted it down with a silver dollar. Counting out forty-nine other dollars from the bag, he sewed them very immediately about the first one, and ran up the trail after his party. Augustino, the gendarme who rarely spoke when he was sober, but who when drunk preached volubly the wisdom of silence, was in the lead, with bent head nosing the track of the quarry, when his keen eyes lighted on the silver dollar holding down the sheet of paper. The first he appropriated, the second he turned over to the jefe. Torres looked over his shoulder, and together they read the mystic fifty. The jefe tossed the scrap of paper aside as of little worth, and was for resuming the chase, but Augustino picked up and pondered the fifty thoughtfully. Even as he pondered it, a shout from Raphael advertised the finding of another dollar. Then Augustino knew there were fifty of the coins to be had for the picking up. Flinging the note to the wind, he was on hands and knees overhauling the ground, the rest of the party joined in the scramble, while Torres and the jefe screamed curses on them in a vain effort to make them proceed. When the gendarmes could find no more, they counted up what they had recovered. The toll came to forty-seven. "'There are three more!' cried Raphael, whereupon all flung themselves into the search again. Five minutes more were lost ere the three other coins were found. Each pocketed what he had retrieved, and obediently swung into the pursuit at the heels of Torres and the jefe. A mile farther on, Torres tried to trample a shining dollar into the dirt, but Augustino's ferret eyes had been too quick, and his eager fingers dug it out of the soft earth. Where was one dollar, as they had already learned, there were more dollars. The posse came to a halt, and while the two leaders fumed and imprecated, the rest of the members cast about right and left from the trail. Vicente, a moon-faced gendarme, who looked more like a Mexican Indian than a Maya or a Panamanian breed, lighted first on the clue. 
all gathered about like hounds around a tree into which the possum has been run in truth it was a tree or a rotten and hollow stump of one a dozen feet in height and a third as many feet in diameter five feet from the ground was an opening above the opening pinned on by a thorn was a sheet of paper the same size as the first they had found on it was written one hundred in the scramble that ensued half a dozen minutes were lost as half a dozen right arms strove to be first in dipping into the hollow heart of the stump to the treasure but the hollow extended deeper than their arms were long we will chop down the stump raphael cried sounding with the back of his machete against the side of it to locate the base of the hollow we will all chop and we will count what we find inside and divide equally by this time their leaders were frantic and the jefe had begun threatening the moment they were back in san antonio to send them to san juan where their carcasses would be picked by the buzzards but we are not back in san antonio thank god said augustino breaking his sober seal of silence in order to enunciate wisdom we are poor men and we will divide in fairness spoke up raphael augustino is right and thank god for it that we are not back in san antonio this rich gringo scatters more money along the way in a day for us to pick up than we could earn in a year where we come from i for one am for revolution where money is plentiful with the rich gringo for a leader augustino supplemented for as long as he leads this way could i follow forever if raphael nodded agreement with a pitch of his head toward torres and the jefe if they do not give us opportunity to gather what the gods have spread for us then to the last and deepest of the roasting hells of hell for them we are men not slaves the world is wide the cordilleras are just beyond we will all be rich and free men and live in the cordilleras where the indian maidens are wildly beautiful and desirable and we will be well rid of our wives back in san antonio said vicente let us now chop down this treasure tree swinging their machetes with heavy hacking blows the wood so rotten that it was spongy gave way readily before their blades and when the stump fell over they counted and divided in equity not one hundred silver dollars but one hundred and forty-seven he is generous this gringo quoth vicente he leaves more than he says may there not be still more and from the debris of rotten wood much of it crumbled to powder under their blows they recovered five more coins in the doing of which they lost ten more minutes that drove torres and jefe to the verge of madness he does not stop to count the wealthy gringo said raphael he must merely open that sack and pour it out and that is the sack with which he rode to the beach of san antonio when he blew up with dynamite the wall of our jail the chase was resumed and all went well for half an hour when they came upon an abandoned freehold already half overrun with the returning jungle a dilapidated straw-thatched house a fallen-in labor barracks a broken-down corral the very posts of which had sprouted and leaved into growing trees and a well showing recent use by virtue of a fresh length of riata attaching bucket to well sweep showed where some men had failed to tame the wild and conspicuously on the well sweep was pinned a familiar sheet of paper on which was written three hundred mother of god a fortune cried raphael may the devil forever torture him in the last and deepest hell was torres's contribution he pays better than your senor regan the jefe sneered in his despair and disgust his bag of silver is only so large torres retorted it seems we must pick it all up before we catch him but when we have picked it all up and his bag is empty then we will catch him we will go on now comrades 
the jefe addressed his posse ingratiatingly afterwards we will return at our leisure and recover the silver augustino broke his seal of silence again one never knows the way of one's return if one ever returns he enunciated pessimistically elated by the pearl of wisdom he had dropped he essayed another three hundred in hand is better than three million in the bottom of a well we may never see again someone must descend into the well spoke raphael testing the braided rope with his weight see the riata is strong we will lower a man by it who is the brave one who will go down i said vicente i will be the brave one to go down and steal half that you find raphael uttered his instant suspicion if you go down first must you count over to us the pesos you already possess then when you come up we can search you for all you have found after that when we have divided equitably will your other pesos be returned to you then will i not go down for comrades who have no trust in me vicente said stubbornly here beside the well I am as wealthy as any of you. Then why should I go down? I have heard of men dying in the bottom of wells. In God's name, go down, stormed the jefe. Haste, haste. I am too fat. The rope is not strong, and I shall not go down, said Vicente. All looked to Augustino, the silent one, who had already spoken more than he was accustomed to speak in a week. Guillermo is the thinnest and lightest, said Augustino. Guillermo, Guillermo will go, go down. down, the rest chorused. But Guillermo, glaring apprehensively at the mouth of the well, backed away, shaking his head and crossing himself. Not for the sacred treasure in the secret city of the mayors, he muttered. The jefe pulled his revolver and glanced to the remainder of the posse for confirmation. With eyes and head nods, they gave it. In heaven's name, go down. He threatened the little gendarme. And make haste, or I shall put you in such a fix that never again will you go up or down, but you will remain here and rot forever beside this hole of perdition. Is it well, comrades, that I kill him if he does not go down? It is, it is well. well, they shouted, and Guillermo, with trembling fingers, counted out the coins he had already retrieved, and in the throes of fear, crossing himself repeatedly, and urged on by the hand thrusts of his companions, stepped upon the bucket, sat down on it with legs wrapped around it, and was lowered away out of the light of day. Stop! He screamed up the shaft. Stop! Stop! The water! I am upon it! Those on the sweep held it with their weight. I should receive ten pesos extra above my share, he called up. You shall receive baptism, was called down to him and variously you will have your fill of water this day we will let go we will cut the rope less with whom to share the water is not nice he replied his voice rising like a ghost's out of the dark depth there are sick lizards and a dead bird that stings and there may be snakes it is well worth ten pesos extra what I must do. We will drown you, Raphael shouted. I shall shoot down upon you and kill you. <laughs> the jefe bullied. Shoot or drown me, Guillermo's voice floated up. But he will buy you nothing, for the treasure will still be in the well. There was a pause in which those at the surface questioned each other with their eyes as to what they should do. And the gringos are running away farther and farther, Torres fumed. 
a fine discipline you have, Signor Mariano Vicariejos, of your gendarmes. This is not San Antonio. The have they flared back? This is the bush of Juctan. My dogs are good dogs in San Antonio. In the bush they must be handled gently, else may they become wild dogs. And what then will happen to you and me? It is the curse of gold. Torres surrendered sadly. It is almost enough to make one become a socialist, with a gringo thus tying the hands of justice with ropes of gold. Of silver. The jefe corrected. You go to hell, said Torres. As you have pointed out, this is not San Antonio, but the bush of Yucatan, and here I may well tell you to go to hell. Why should you and I quarrel because of your bad temper when our prosperity depends on standing together? Besides, the voice of Guillermo drifted up. The water is not two feet deep. You cannot drown me in it. I have just felt the bottom, and I have four round silver pesos in my hand right now. The bottom is carpeted with pesos. Do you want to let go? Or do I get ten pesos extra for the filthy job? The water stinks like a fresh graveyard. Yes, yes, yes. They shouted down. Which? Let go? Or the extra ten? The, the extra, extra ten. ten. They chorused. In God's name, haste, haste, cried the jefe. They heard splashings and curses from the bottom of the well, and from the lightning of the strain on the riata knew that Guillermo had left the bucket and was floundering for the coin. Put it in the bucket, good Guillermo, Raphael called down. I am putting it in my pocket. Up came the reply. Did I put it in the bucket? You might haul it up first and well forget to haul me up afterward. The double weight might break the riata, Raphael cautioned. The riata may not be so strong as my will, for my will in this matter is most strong, said Guillermo. If the riata should break, Raphael began again. I have a solution, said Guillermo. Do you come down? Then shall I go up first, second the treasure shall go up in the bucket, and third and last shall you go up. Thus will justice be triumphant. Raphael, with dropped jaw of dismay, did not reply. Are you coming, Raphael? No, he answered. Put all the silver in your pockets and come up together with it. I could curse the race that bore me, was the impatient observation of the jefe. I have already cursed it, said Torres. Haul away, shouted Guillermo. I have everything in my pocket save the stench, and I am suffocating. Haul quick, or I shall perish, and the three hundred pesos will perish with me. And there are more than three hundred. He must have emptied his bag. Ahead, on the trail, where the way grew steep, and the horses, without stamina, rested and panted, Francis overtook his party. Never again shall I travel without minted coin of the realm, he exulted, as he described what he had remained behind to see from the edge of the deserted plantation. Henry... When I die and go to heaven, I shall have a stout bag of cash along with me. Even there could it redeem me from heaven alone knows what scrapes. Listen, they fought like cats and dogs about the mouth of the well. Nobody would trust anybody to descend into the well unless he deposited what he had previously picked up with those that remained at the top. They were out of hand. The jefe, at the point of his gun, had to force the littlest and leanest of them to go down. And when he was down, he blackmailed them before he would come up. And when he came up, they broke their promises and gave him a beating. They were still beating him when I left. But now your sack is empty, said Henry. Which is our present and most pressing trouble. Francis agreed. 
Had I sufficient pesos, I could keep the pursuit well behind us for ever. I'm afraid I was too generous. I did not know how cheap the poor devils were. But I'll tell you something that will make your hair stand up. Torres, Senor Torres, Senor Alvarez Torres, the elegant gentleman and old-time friend of you, Solanos, is leading the pursuit along with the jefe. He is furious at the delay. They almost had a rupture because the jefe couldn't keep his men in hand. Yes, sir, and he told the jefe to go to hell. I distinctly heard him tell the jefe to go to hell. Five miles further on, the horses of Leoncia and her father, in collapse, where the trail plunged into and ascended a dark ravine, Francis urged the others on and dropped behind. Giving them a few minutes' start, he followed on behind, a self-constituted rear guard. Part way along, in an open space where grew only a thick sod of grass, he was dismayed to find the hoof-prints of the two horses staring at him as large as dinner-plates from out of the sod. Into the hoof-prints had welled a dark, slimy fluid that his eye told him was crude oil. This was but the beginning, a sort of seepage from a side stream above, off from the main flow. A hundred yards beyond he came upon the flow itself a river of oil that on such a slope would have been a cataract had it been water. But being crude oil, as thick as molasses, it oozed slowly down the hill like so much molasses. And here, preferring to make his stand rather than to wade through the sticky mess, Francis sat down on a rock, laid his rifle on one side of him, his automatic pistol on the other side, rolled a cigarette, and kept his ears pricked for the first sounds of the pursuit. And the beaten peon, threatened with more beatings and belaboring his overridden mare, rode across the top of the ravine above Francis, and at the oil well itself had his exhausted animal collapse under him. With his heels he kicked her back to her feet, and with a stick belabored her to stagger away from him and on and into the jungle and the first day of his adventures, although he did not know it, was not yet over. He, too, squatted on a stone, his feet out of the oil, rolled a cigarette, and, as he smoked it, contemplated the flowing oil well. The noise of approaching men startled him, and he fled into the immediately adjacent jungle, from which he peered forth, and saw two strange men appear. They came directly to the well, and by an iron wheel turning the valve, choked down the flow still further. No more, commanded the one who seemed to be leader. Another turn, and the pressure will blow out the pipes, for so the gringo engineer has warned me most carefully. And a slight flow, beyond the limited safety, continued to run from the mouth of the gusher down the mountainside. Scarcely had the two men accomplished this when a body of horsemen rode up, whom the peon in hiding recognized as the haciendado who owned him and the overseers and haciendados of neighboring plantations who delighted in running down a fugitive laborer in much the same way that the English delight in chasing the fox. No, the two oilmen had seen nobody. But the haciendado who led saw the footprints of the mare, and spurred his horse to follow, his crowd at his heels. The peon waited, smoked his cigarette quite to the finish, and cogitated. When all was clear, he ventured forth, turned the mechanism controlling the well wide open, watched the oil fountaining upward under the subterranean pressure and flowing down the mountain in a veritable river. Also, he listened to and noted the sobbing and gasping and bubbling of the escaping gas. This he did not comprehend, and all that saved him for his further adventures was the fact that he had used his last match to light his cigarette. In vain he searched his rags, his ears, and his hair. He was out of matches. 
so chuckling at the river of oil he was wantonly running to waste and remembering the canyon trail below he plunged down the mountainside and upon francis who received him with extended automatic down went the peon on his frayed and frazzled knees in terror and supplication to the man he had twice betrayed that day francis studied him at first without recognition because of the bruised and lacerated face and head on which the blood had dried like a mask amigo amigo chattered the peon but at that moment from below on the ravine trail francis heard the clatter of a stone dislodged by some man's foot the next moment he identified what was left of the peon as the pitiable creature to whom he had given half the contents of his whiskey flask well amigo francis said in the native language it looks as if they're after you they will kill me they will beat me to death they are very angry the wretch quavered you are my only friend my father and my mother save me can you shoot francis demanded i was a hunter in the cordilleras before i was sold into slavery senor was the reply francis passed him the automatic motioned him to take shelter and told him not to fire until sure of a hit and to himself he mused the golfers are out on the links right now at tarrytown and Mrs. Bellingham is on the clubhouse veranda, wondering how she was going to pay the three thousand points she's behind and praying for a change of luck. And here am I, Lord, Lord, backed up to a river of oil. His musing ceased as abruptly as appeared the jefe, Torres, and the gendarmes down the trail. As abruptly he fired his rifle, and as abruptly they fell back out of sight. He could not tell whether he had hit one or whether the man had merely fallen in precipitate retreat. The pursuers did not care to make a rush of it, contenting themselves with bushwhacking. Francis and the peon did the same, sheltering behind rocks and bushes and frequently changing their positions. At the end of an hour, the last cartridge in Francis's rifle was all that remained. The peon, under his warnings and threats, still retained two cartridges in the automatic. But the hour had been an hour saved for Leoncia and her people, and Francis was contentedly aware that at any moment he could turn and escape by wading across the river of oil. So all was well, and would have been well had not from above come an eruption of another body of men who from behind trees fired as they descended this was the haciendado and his fellow haciendados in chase of the fugitive peon although francis did not know it his conclusion was that it was another posse that was after him the shots they fired at him were strongly confirmative the peon crawled to his side showed him that two shots remained in the automatic he was returning to him, and impressively begged from him his box of matches. Next, the peon motioned him to cross the bottom of the canyon and climb the other side. With half a guess of the creature's intention, Francis complied, from his new position of vantage, emptying his last rifle cartridge at the advancing posse and sending it back into shelter down the ravine. The next moment, the river of oil flared into flame from where the peon had touched a match to it. In the following moment, clear up the mountainside, the well itself sent a fountain of ignited gas a hundred feet into the air, and in the moment after, the ravine itself poured a torrent of flame down upon the posse of Torres and the Jefe. Scorched by the heat of the conflagration, Francis and the peon clawed up the opposite side of the ravine, circled around and passed the blazing trail, and, at a dog trot, raced up the recovered trail. End of chapter 9
Chapter Ten of Hearts of Three by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. While Francis and the peon hurried up the ravine trail in safety, the ravine itself, below where the oil flowed in, had become a river of flame, which drove the jefe, torres, and the gendarmes to scale the steep wall of the ravine. At the same time, the party of haciendados, in pursuit of the peon, was compelled to claw back and up to escape out of the roaring canyon. Ever the peon glanced backward over his shoulder, until, with a cry of joy, he indicated a second black smoke pillar rising in the air beyond the first burning well. More, he chuckled. There are more wells. They will all burn, and so shall they and all their race pay for the many blows they have beaten on me. And there is a lake of oil there, like the sea, the Huishitan Inlet, it is so big. And Francis recollected the lake of oil about which the haciendado had told him, that, containing at least five million barrels which could not be piped to sea transport, lay open to the sky, merely in a natural depression in the ground and contained by an earth dam. How much are you worth? he demanded of the peon with apparent irrelevance, but the peon could not understand. How much are your clothes worth, all you've got on? Half a peso. Nay, half of half a peso. The peon admitted ruefully, surveying what was left of his tattered rags. And other property? The wretched creature shrugged his shoulders in token of his utter destitution, then added bitterly, I possess nothing but a debt. I owe two hundred and fifty pesos. I am tied to it for life, damned with it for life like a man with a cancer. That is why I am a slave to the hacendado. <laughs> Francis could not forbear to grin. Worth two hundred and fifty pesos less than nothing, not even a cipher. A sheer abstraction of a minus quantity without existence, save in the mathematical imagination of man. And yet here you are burning up not less than millions of pesos worth of oil. And if the strata is loose and erratic and the oil leaks up outside the tubing, the chances are that the oil body of the entire field is ignited, say a billion dollars worth. Say, for an abstraction enjoying $250 worth of non-existence, you are some hombre, believe me nothing of which the peon understood, save the word hombre. I am a man, he proclaimed, thrusting out his chest and straightening up his bruised head. I am an hombre, and I am a maya. Maya Indian? You? Francis scoffed. Half maya, was the reluctant admission. My father is pure maya. The mayor women of the Cordilleras did not satisfy him. He must love a mixed-breed woman of the Tierra Caliente. I was so born. But she afterward betrayed him for a Barbados nigger, and he went back to the Cordilleras to live. And like my father, I was born to love a mixed-breed of the Tierra Caliente. She wanted money, and my head was fevered with want of her, and I sold myself to be a peon for two hundred pesos. And I saw neither her nor the money again. For five years I have been a peon. For five years I have slaved and be beaten, and behold, at the end of five years, my debt is not two hundred, but two hundred and fifty pesos. And while Francis Morgan and the long-suffering Maya half-breed plodded on deeper into the Cordilleras to overtake their party, and while the oil fields of Jukitan continued to go up in increasing smoke, still further on in the heart of the Cordilleras were preparing other events destined to bring together all pursuers and all pursued. Francis and Henry and Leoncia and their party, the peon, the party of the haciendados, and the gendarmes of the jefe, and along with them Alvarez Torres, eager to win for himself not only the promised reward of Thomas Regan, but the possession of Leoncia Solano. In a cave sat a man and a woman. Pretty the latter was, and young, 
a mestiza or half-caste woman by the light of a cheap kerosene lamp she read aloud from a calf-bound tome which was a spanish translation of blackstone both were barefooted and bare-armed clad in hooded gabardines of sackcloth her hood lay back on her shoulders exposing her black and generous head of hair but the old man's hood was cowled about his head after the fashion of a monk the face lofty and ascetic beaked with power was pure spanish don quixote might have worn precisely a similar face but there was a difference the eyes of this old man were closed in the perpetual dark of the blind never could he behold a windmill at which to tilt he sat while the pretty mestiza read to him listening and brooding for all the world in the pose of rodin's thinker nor was he a dreamer nor a tilter of windmills like don quixote despite his blindness that ever veiled the apparent face of the world in invisibility he was a man of action and his soul was anything but blind penetrating unerringly beneath the show of things to the heart and the soul of the world and reading its inmost sins and rapacities and noblenesses and virtues he lifted his hand and put a pause in the reading while he thought aloud from the context of the reading the law of man he said with slow certitude is today a game of wits not equity but wit is the game of law today the law in its inception was good but the way of the law the practice of it has led men off into false pursuits they have mistaken the way for the goal the means for the end yet is law law and necessary and good only law in its practice to-day has gone astray judges and lawyers engaged in competitions and a phrase of wit and learning quite forgetting the plaintiffs and defendants before them and paying them who are seeking equity and justice and not wit and learning yet is old blackstone right under it all at the bottom of it all at the beginning and the building of the edifice of law is the quest the earnest and sincere quest of righteous men for justice and equity but what is it that the preacher said they made themselves many inventions and the law good in its beginning has been invented out of all its intent so that it serves neither litigants nor injured ones but merely the fatted judges and the lean and hungry lawyers who achieve names and paunches if they prove themselves cleverer than their opponents and then the judges who render decision he paused still posed as rodin's thinker and meditated while the mestiza woman waited his customary signal to resume the reading at last as out of a profound of thought in which universes had been weighed in the balance he spoke but we have law here in the cordilleras of panama that is just and right and all of equity we work for no man and serve not even paunches sackcloth and not broadcloth conduces to the equity of judicial decision read on mercedes blackstone is always right if always rightly read which is what is called a paradox and is what modern law ordinarily is a paradox read on blackstone is the very foundation of human law but oh how many wrongs are cleverly committed by clever men in his name ten minutes later the blind thinker raised his head sniffed the air and gestured the girl to pause taking her cue from him she too sniffed perhaps it is the lamp oh dust one she suggested it is burning oil he said but it is not the lamp it is from far away also have i heard shooting in the canyons i heard nothing she began 
daughter you who see have not the need to hear what i have there have been many shots fired in the canyons order my children to investigate and make report bowing reverently to the old man who could not see but who by keen trained hearing and conscious timing of her every muscular action knew that she had bowed the young woman lifted the curtain of blankets and passed out into the day at either side the cave mouth sat a man of the peon class each was armed with rifle and machete while through their girdles were thrust naked-bladed knives at the girl's order both arose and bowed not to her but to the command and the invisible source of the command one of them tapped with the back of his machete against the stone upon which he had been sitting then laid his ear to the stone and listened in truth the stone was but the outjut of a vein of metalliferous ore that extended across and through the heart of the mountain and beyond on the opposite slope in an eyrie commanding the magnificent panorama of the descending slopes of the cordilleras sat another peon who first listened with his ear pressed to similar metalliferous quartz and next tapped response with his machete after that he stepped half a dozen paces to a tall tree half dead reached into the hollow heart of it and pulled on the rope within as a man might pull who was ringing a steeple bell but no sound was evoked instead a lofty branch fifty feet above his head sticking out from the main trunk like a semaphore arm moved up and down like the semaphore arm it was two miles away on a mountain crest the branch of a similar semaphore tree replied still beyond that and farther down the slopes the flashing of a hand mirror in the sun heliographed the relaying of the blind man's message from the cave and all that portion of the cordilleras became voluble with coded speech of vibrating ore veins sun flashings and waving tree branches while enrico solano slenderly erect on his horse as an indian youth and convoyed on either side by his sons alessandro and ricardo hanging to his saddle trappings made the best of the time afforded them by francis's rearguard battle with the gendarmes leonce on her mount and henry morgan lagged behind one or the other was continually glancing back for the sight of francis overtaking them watching his opportunity henry took the back trail five minutes afterward leoncia no less anxious than he for francis's safety tried to turn her horse about but the animal eager for the companionship of its mate ahead refused to obey the rein cut up and pranced and then deliberately settled into a balk dismounting and throwing her reins on the ground in the panamanian method of tethering a saddle horse leoncia took the back trail on foot so rapidly did she follow henry that she was almost treading on his heels when he encountered francis and the peon the next moment both henry and francis were chiding her for her conduct but in both their voices was the involuntary tenderness of love which pleased neither to hear the other uttering their hearts more active than their heads they were caught in total surprise by the party of haciendados that dashed out upon them with covering rifles from the surrounding jungle despite the fact that they had thus captured the runaway peon whom they proceeded to kick and cuff all would have been well with leoncia and the two morgans had the owner of the peon the old-time friend of the solano family been present but an attack of the malarial fever which was his due every third day, had stretched him out in a chill near the burning oil field. Nevertheless, though by their blows they reduced the peon to weepings and pleadings on his knees, the haciendados were courteously gentle to Leoncia and quite decent to Francis and Henry, even though they tied the hands of the latter two behind them in preparation for the march up the ravine slope to where the horses had been left but upon the peon with latin american cruelty they continued to reiterate their rage yet they were destined to arrive nowhere 
by themselves with their captives shouts of joy heralded the debauchment upon the scene of the jefe's gendarmes and of the jefe and alvarez torres arose at once the rapid-fire staccato bastard latin of all men of both parties of pursuers trying to explain and demanding explanation at one and the same time and while the fargo of all talking simultaneously and of no one winning anywhere in understanding made anarchy of speech torres with a nod to francis and a sneer of triumph to henry ranged before leoncia and bowed low to her in true and deep hidalgo courtesy and respect listen he said low-voiced as she rebuffed him with an arm movement of repulsion do not misunderstand me do not mistake me i am here to save you and no matter what may happen to protect you you are the lady of my dreams i will die for you yes and gladly though far more gladly would i leave for you i do not understand she replied curtly i do not see life or death in the issue we have done no wrong i have done no wrong nor has my father nor has francis morgan nor has henry morgan therefore sir the matter is not a question of life or death henry and francis shouldering close to leoncia on either side listened and caught through the hubble bubble of many voices the conversation of leoncia and torres it is a question absolute of certain death by execution for henry morgan torres persisted proven beyond doubt is his conviction for the murder of afaro serrano who was your own full-blood uncle and your father's own full-blood brother there is no chance to save henry morgan but francis morgan i can save an altruity if if leoncia queried with almost the snap of jaws of a she-leopard if you prove kind to me and marry me torres said with magnificent steadiness although two gringos helpless their hands tied behind their backs glared at him through their eyes their common desire for his immediate extinction torres in a genuine outburst of his passion though his rapid glances had assured him of the helplessness of the two morgans seized her hands in his and urged leoncia as your husband i might be able to do something for henry even may it be possible for me to save his life and his neck if he will yield to leaving panama immediately you spanish dog henry snarled at him struggling with his tied hands behind his back in an effort to free them gringo cur torres retorted as with an open backhanded blow he struck henry on the mouth on the instant henry's foot shot out and the kick in torres's side drove him staggering in the direction of francis who was no less quick with a kick of his own back and forth like a shuttlecock between the battle doors torres was kicked from one man to the other until the gendarmes seized the two gringos and began to beat them in their helplessness torres not only urged the gendarmes on but himself drew a knife and a red tragedy might have happened with offended latin american blood up and raging had not a score or more of armed men silently appeared and silently taken charge of the situation some of the mysterious newcomers were clad in cotton singlets and trousers and others were in cowled gabardines of sackcloth the gendarmes and haciendados recoiled in fear crossing themselves muttering prayers and ejaculating the blind brigand the cruel just one they are his people we are lost but the much-beaten peon sprang forward and fell on his bleeding knees before a stern-faced man who appeared to be the leader of the blind brigand's men from the mouth of the peon poured forth a stream of loud lamentation and outcry for justice you know that justice to which you appeal the leader spoke gutturally yes 
the crew of justice. The peon replied. I know what it means to appeal to the crew of justice. Yet, I do appeal, for I seek justice, and my cause is just. I too demand the cruel justice, Leoncia cried with flashing eyes, although she added in an undertone to Francis and Henry, Whatever the cruel justice is. It will have to go some to be unfairer than the justice we can expect from Tories and Hefe. Henry replied in similar undertones, then stepped forward boldly before the cowled leader and said loudly, And I demand the cruel justice. The leader nodded. Me too. Francis murmured low and then made loud demand. The Hendarmes did not seem to count in the matter, while the haciendados signified their willingness to abide by whatever justice the blind brigand might mete out to them. Only the jefe objected. Maybe you don't know who I am, he blustered. I am Mariano Vercara Ejijos, a long, illustrious name and long and honorable career. I am jefe politico of San Antonio, the highest friend of the governor and high in the confidence of the government of the Republic of Panama. I am the law. There is but one law and one justice, which is of Panama, and not the Cordilleros. I protest against this mountain law you call the cruel justice. I shall send an army against your blind brigand, and the buzzards will peck his bones in San Juan. Remember, Torres sarcastically warned the irate jefe, that this is not San Antonio but the bush of Yucatan. Also, you have no army. Have these two men been unjust to anyone who has appealed to the cruel justice? The leader asked abruptly. Yes, asseverated the peon. They have beaten me. Everybody has beaten me. They too have beaten me and without cause. My hand is bloody. My body is bruised and torn. Again, I appeal to the cruel justice, and I charge these two men with injustice. The leader nodded, and to his own men indicated the disarming of the prisoners and the order of the march. Justice! I demand equal justice! Henry cried out. My hands are tied behind my back. All hands should be so tied, or no hands should be so tied. Besides, it's very difficult to walk when one is so tied. The shadow of a smile drifted the lips of the leader as he directed his men to cut the lashings that invidiously advertised the inequality complained of. Ha! Huh. Francis grinned to Leoncia and Henry. I have a vague memory that somewhere around a million years ago I used to live in a quiet little old burg called New York, where we foolishly thought we were the wildest and wickedest that ever cracked at a golf ball, electrocuted an inspector of police, battled with Tammany, or bid four nullos with five short tricks in one's own hand. Huh. Henry vouchsafed half an hour later, as the trail, from a lesser crest, afforded a view of higher crests beyond. Huh. And hell's bells, these gunny-sack chaps are not animals of savages. Look, Henry, they are semaphoring. See that near tree there and that big one across the canyon? Watch the branches wave. Blindfolded for a number of miles at the last, the prisoners, still blindfolded, were led into the cave where the cruel justice reigned. When the bandages were removed, they found themselves in a vast and lofty cavern, lighted by many torches, and, confronting them, a blind and white-haired man in sackcloth seated on a rock-hewn throne, with beneath him, her shoulder at his knees, a pretty mestiza woman. The blind man spoke, and in his voice was the thin and bell-like silver of age and weary wisdom. The cruel justice has been invoked. Speak. Who demands decision and equity? All held back, and not even the jefe could summon heart of courage to protest against Cordillera's law. 
there is a woman present continued the blind brigand let her speak first all mortal men and women are guilty of something or else are charged by their fellows with some guilt henry and francis were for withstraining her but with an equal smile to them she addressed the cruel just one in clear and ringing tones i only have aided the man i am engaged to marry to escape from death for a murder he did not commit you have spoken said the blind brigand come forward to me piloted by sackcloth men while the two morgans who loved her were restless and perturbed she was made to kneel at the blind man's knees the mestiza girl placed his hand on leoncia's head for a full and solemn minute silence obtained while the steady fingers of the blind one rested about her forehead and registered the pulse beats of her temples then he removed his hand and leaned back to decision arise senorita he pronounced your heart is clean of evil you go free who else appeals to the cruel justice francis immediately stepped forward i likewise help the man to escape from an undeserved death the man and i are of the same name and distantly of the same blood he too knelt and felt the soft finger lobes play delicately over his brows and temples and come to rest finally on the pulse of his wrist it is not all clear to me said the blind one you are not at rest nor at peace with your soul there is trouble within you that vexes you suddenly the peon stepped forth and spoke unbidden his voice evoking a thrill as the shock of blasphemy from the sackcloth men oh, just one let this man go said the peon passionately twice was i weak and betrayed him to his enemy this day and twice this day has he protected me from my enemy and saved me and the peon once again on his knees but this time at the knees of justice thrilled and shivered with superstitious awe as he felt wander over him the light but firm finger touches of the strangest judge man ever knelt before bruises and lacerations were swiftly explored even to the shoulders and down the back the other man goes free the cruel just one announced yet is there trouble and unrest within him is one here who knows and will speak up and francis knew on the instant the trouble the blind man had divined within him the full love that burned in him for leoncia and that threatened to shatter the full loyalty he must ever bear to henry no less quick was leoncia in knowing and could the blind man have beheld the involuntary glance of knowledge the man and woman threw at each other and the immediate embarrassment of averted eyes he could have unerringly diagnosed francis's trouble the mestiz a girl saw and with a leap at her heart scented a love affair likewise had henry seen and unconsciously scowled the just one spoke an affair of the heart undoubtedly he dismissed the matter the eternal vexation of woman in the heart of man nevertheless this man stands free twice in the one day has he succored the man who twice betrayed him nor has the trouble within him aught to do with the aid he rendered the man said to be sentenced to death undeserved remains to question this last man also to settle for this beaten creature before me who twice this day has proved weak out of selfishness and who has just now proved bravely strong out of unselfishness for another he leaned forward and played his hands searchingly over the face and brows of the peon are you afraid to die he asked suddenly great and holy one i am sore afraid to die was the peon's reply then say that you have lied about this man say that his twice succoring of you was a lie and you shall live 
Under the blind one's fingers, the peon cringed and wilted. Think well, came the solemn warning. Death is not good. To be forever unmoving, as the clod and rock, is not good. Say that you have lied, and life is yours. Speak. But although his voice shook from the exquisiteness of his fear, the peon rose to the full spiritual stature of a man. Twice this day did I betray him, holy one. But my name is not Peter. Not thrice in this day will I betray him. I am sore afraid, but I cannot betray him thrice. The blind judge leaned back, and his face beamed and glowed as if transfigured. Well spoken, he said. You have the makings of a man. I now lay my sentence upon you. From now on, through all your days under the sun, you shall always think like a man, act like a man, be a man. Better to die a man any time than to live a beast forever in time. The ecclesiastist was wrong. A dead lion is always better than a live dog. Go free, regenerate son, go free. But as the peon, at a signal from the mestiza, started to rise, the blind judge stopped him. In the beginning, O oh man, who but this day has been born man? What was the cause of all your troubles? My heart was weak and hungry, O oh holy one, for a mixed-breed woman of the Tierra Caliente. I myself am mountain-born. For her I put myself in debt to the Hacendado for the sum of two hundred pesos. She fled with the money and another man. I remained the slave of the Hacendado, who was not a bad man, but who first and always is a Hacendado. I have toiled, been beaten, and have suffered for five long years. My debt has now become two hundred and fifty pesos, yet I possess naught but these rags and a body weak from insufficient food. Was she wonderful, this woman of the Tierra Caliente? The blind judge queried softly. I was mad for her, holy one. I do not think now that she was wonderful. But she was wonderful then. The fever of her burned my heart and brain and made a task slave of me, though she fled in the night, and I never knew her again. The peon waited on his knees with bowed head, while, to the amazement of all, the blind brigand sighed deeply, and seemed to forget time and place. His hand strayed involuntarily and automatically to the head of the mestiza, caressed the shining black hair, and continued to caress it while he spoke. The woman, he said with such gentleness that his voice, still clear and bell-like, was barely above a whisper. Ever the woman, wonderful. All women are wonderful, to man. They love our fathers. They birth us. We love them. They birth our sons to love their daughters, and to call their daughters wonderful. And this has always been, and shall continue always to be, until the end of man's time and man's loving on earth. A profound of silence fell within the cavern, while the cruel just one meditated for a space. At the last, with a touch dared of familiarity, the pretty mestiza touched him and roused him to remembrance of the peon still crouching at his feet. I pronounce judgment. He spoke. You have received many blows. Each blow on your body is quittance in full of the entire debt to the haciendado. Go free, but remain in the mountains, and next time love a mountain woman, since woman you must have, and since woman is inevitable and eternal in the affairs of men. Go free. You are half Maya. I am half Maya, the peon murmured. My father is a Maya. Arise and go free, and remain in the mountains with your Maya father. The Tierra Caliente is no place for the Cordilleras born. 
the haciendado is not present and therefore cannot be judged and after all he is but a haciendado his fellow haciendados too go free the cruel just one waited and without waiting henry stepped forward i am the man he stated boldly sentenced to the death undeserved for the killing of a man i did not kill he was the blood uncle of the girl i love whom i shall marry if there be true justice here in this cave in the cordilleras but the jefe interrupted before a score of witnesses he threatened to his face to kill the man within the hour we found him bending over the man's dead body that was yet warm and limber with departing life he speaks true henry affirmed i did threaten the man both of us heady from strong drink and hot blood i was so found bending over his dead warm body yet did i not kill him nor do i know nor can i guess the coward hand in the dark that knifed out his life through the back from behind kneel both of you that i may interrogate you the blind brigand commanded long he interrogated with his sensitive questioning fingers long and longer still unable to attain decision his fingers played over the faces and pulses of the two men is there a woman he asked henry morgan pointedly a woman wonderful i love her it is good to be so vexed for a man unvexed by woman is only half a man the blind judge vouchsafed he addressed the jefe no woman vexes you yet are you troubled but this man indicating henry i cannot tell if all his vexation be due to woman perhaps in part it may be due to you or to what some prompting of evil may make him meditate against you stand up both men of you i cannot judge between you yet is there the test infallible the test of the snake and the bird infallible it is as god is infallible for by such ways does god still maintain truth in the affairs of men as well does blackstone mention just such methods of determining the truth by trial and ordeal end of chapter ten